Some listeners may be offended by the content. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Spotcast Season 3, Episode 19, Star Date 98543, Mark 57. My name is Tim Mitra. I'm in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hello there. We have Jaime Lopez Jr. on the line in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? How's it going? How's it going indeed? It is Disney Plus Tastic. Is it Disney Plus Tastic? All righty. 80. 80. Oh, season 3. I know it pales 19. next to you guys in your uh, crazy... 321? Yeah, exactly. But who's counting? Yeah. So does that mean you've done like 500 podcasts, Tim? Personally? Yeah. Yeah, I've done 100 with Tammy and yeah. 100 and something with Tammy and almost 100 with you. Or yeah, 100 minus 2 with you, I think. Lots of podcasts. Yeah, and it's like, you know, what is what does six years worth of podcasting experience get you? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's you nothing. I mean, there's people out there who know who I am, but that's about it, right? All righty. It's not like and we're, and podcasting isn't seen as real journalism yet, or so I'm so I hear. Well, only, Although, only when it's subsidized by a real journalistic organization, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like like most of the podcasts that are that are out there, big the big names are like you know people who rolled off of TV and radio and you know yep. and book writing, book, book writing, uh, like, right. like Malcolm Malcolm Godwell and those kind of guys. You know? mm-hmm. Not too shabby. Well, let's let's get the let's get the fact check out of the way so we can get to the headlines. <laughs> we were talking about Murray Martin last week, who was the star who played. Peter Pan on Broadway, I think, and, and a few other places like that. But uh, um, I've forgotten that we also had a Sound of Music soundtrack album. And, you know, much to my surprise, it wasn't Julie Andrews singing. It was Mary Martin singing. She must have played um, uh, Maria on uh, stage in Broadway as well, I, as well, I guess. And uh, I said Albert somebody or other was the old man in Chico and the Man. He was, it was actually played by Jack Albertson, played the man on Chico and the Man with, with Freddie Prince. But he was also probably known to you guys as Grandpa on the original Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka. Oh, yeah, now yeah, I know yeah. who it is. Yeah, now you know who it is. Now you know. All right. So the moment Jonathan's been waiting for, the headlines Woo! and the top story today is Disney, despite what we were saying the other day, is uh, set to reveal tons of movies. Tur- turbocharging streaming offerings is what it says here. And uh, so I posted a story and Jonathan posted the follow-up story. So basically, yeah, it's like, you know, we were we were sort of, you know, ready to, to get, you know, make the casket for the Star Wars franchise but apparently we were a little premature yeah that's uh they definitely decided to stick it to us today but i am grateful for them to doing it on a recording day as opposed to waiting till the day after right. which is oh, usually our yeah. luck and uh, of course tom hanks is geppetto because of course because tom of hanks course is. is geppetto yeah of course he is i don't know do you think so really sure okay okay so right. we're we're talking about the fact that they uh disney plus and disney overall announced they're going to be doing just a massive amount of star wars marvel and other content, uh, some of which is ending up on their streaming platform and some of it is ending up in the movie theaters. But it is just a whack load of announcements today and like really, really meaty stuff with stars up the yin yang. Like this is just crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we got Star Wars Ahsoka starring Rosario Dawson. We got Star Wars Rangers of the New Republic, which is again supposed to be set in that same time frame as Mandalorian. We got a Star Wars event series based around Lando, which I haven't seen the details. I don't know if that's they've confirmed that that's um, uh, Donald Glover. Right. Uh, they and they confirmed or they firmed up the Cassian Andor series, the Obi Wan Kenobi series we knew about. Star Wars: A Droid Story is also coming. Star Wars: The Acolyte. That's the series we talked about before. That's going to be female led and uh, female starring. And, and Star Wars: and The Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, yeah really. Uh, uh, Star Wars: Visions. Now this one's that was really cool. Star Wars: Visions is uh, apparently an anime take on Star Wars. That'll be really interesting and they also announced a new theatrical movie directed by patty jenkins star wars rogue squadron and then they decided they would double down on that by announcing their marvel slate so they announced the fantastic four is coming to the mcu they announced again yeah they announced well for the first time the actual mcu hopefully the first time done right Mm. uh they announced uh the third 
Ant-Man movie, which is going to be called Quantumania, uh, an I Am Groot TV series, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, uh, Armor Wars starring Don Cheadle as War Machine, Iron Heart, which is a spinoff from Iron Man. It's about uh, a character that they've introduced in the comics called Riri Williams, who is another armored superhero. Secret Invasion, which is the long rumored Nick Fury series. Uh, they doubled down and confirmed the, the Moon Knight series that had been talked about with Oscar Isaacs. Tatiana Maslany, the lying person she is, uh, <laughs> was confirmed <laughs> as She-Hulk. Uh, and then Hawkeye, they announced, uh, we knew we were getting a Hawkeye series, but we know now that uh, Haley Steinfeld, very, very popular young actress, is going to be Kate Bishop, the uh, understudy Hawkeye. And we got Captain Marvel 2 on top of that. Oh, and they also announced the, confirmed the Willow series and uh, the whole, sl- a whole slate of new Disney proper stuff, including Pinocchio as Jaime mentioned last week and they also uh, revealed more Pixar content and uh, Turner and Hooch reboot and man it is just a content orama so so this begs the question Jaime <laughs> now how much would you pay <laughs> or so is, more to the point is, is will all, you pay yeah is it all coming out between December 15th and January 15th is, <laughs> is this a huge deal for me as, I, as we record here it is the 10th so it's a few days before I will join Disney plus binge the heck out of most of the first two seasons of mandalorian so that i can watch the the only episode i will ever see apparently that's not spoiled for me of mandalorian on friday the 18th and then that gives me just enough time to watch mulan and um uh, uh, hamilton so that by the final day of my one month subscription i will see the premiere episode of wandavision yeah mm-hmm. on january 15th so and you'll and you'll like it so much you'll come back for more yeah yeah so yeah this is really uh, an impressive amount of stuff. Yeah, I mean, they just made staying home cool. Like this, yeah. it just reversed the <laughs> like pandemic. I was going to stay home and watch all this stuff anyways. It's uh, it is a staggering amount of content. It, it really is. Um, I'm honestly surprised. I mean, I know that they were doing this. Apparently, they made the announcement today at a, at a shareholders event. But uh, it is amazing how much content they dropped in one sort of go. Obviously, we'd known about some of this stuff. We knew they were going to do a Moon Knight series and a She Hulk series, and some of this stuff was in the offing. But holy moly did they ever just just pull us over i mean i i made the comment to my wife earlier this, this is the number one streaming service this is it like this this just it, it, obviously it still has to roll it out so people like Jaime may want to wait until it gets to a certain tipping point but there, there is a future and a not distant future where every week there will be a new episode of something that you will want to watch they will have either a marvel series or a star wars series or some other disney exclusive that you're going to want to watch and they'll do that 52 weeks a year because they're Disney. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, as just noticing too, like, like it used to be 10 years ago, you would say you, you'd watch something and they'd say, and follow us on Facebook. And then, you know, then it came check out our app. Right. And now if you, I've watched at least two or three commercials during, during the broadcast of start or discovery this, this evening that said now streaming mm-hmm. at the end of, you know, trailers. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's the new Brian Cranston, um, series on HBO Max and Crave in mm-hmm, Canada. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's the other one? The one with Haley Kelly Kualko. Um, oh, the, the stewardess? The flight, the flight attendant? attendant? Yeah. 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 That one's also, and they both end with now streaming on HBO Max, yeah. right? So it's sort of the new, I think that's, they've, they've confirmed that that's where it is. And, you know, I, I'm seeing more and more masks on TV and, mm-hmm. you know, social distancing on TV. And, you know, so I think it's it's confirmed that this is this is now a lasting thing, right? Yeah. The only thing they didn't announce is the, the Black widow right they didn't say anything about black widow today so that was the one thing we were kind of waiting for the shoe to drop on was are they going to start moving their huge billion dollar blockbuster films to their streaming service and the answer so far is no you think if they were going to do it they'd have done it today right right well that said i think in five days tenant comes out on on blu-ray right so and streaming yeah yeah so yeah it's it's kind of that that's where we are right yeah and if only we could get uh warner brothers to wake up and put their stuff on streaming here in canada we'd be all set (laughs) yeah this this will be interesting because it's um you know on paper uh on paper it's very powerful because the the big knock on Disney Plus has been oh it's great with that massive back catalog right it's it's hard to 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 get the kind of back catalog quality and quantity that Disney just happens to own mm-hmm. um but it was like oh cool so other than Mandalorian and like occasional things like Mulan occasional things like um Hamilton what else are you going to watch and it seems like they they They've turned the 
the battleship around and they've they've got all the guns ready to fire as they've finally just gotten the plan in place. So they can, if they could execute on it, I think it will definitely be one of the, if not the top streaming service everybody be talking about. Yep. It will be challenging because Mandalorian has gotten so much love out of the community that everything will be measured against Mandalorian. Yep. Um, and and it kind of makes way. me wonder uh, in, in a very particular way, do we have any info about, okay, young Lando, but where in the timeline for, for him? Because I really liked uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character L337, mm-hmm. the droid, yeah. who is gone, spoilers, at the end of Solo, right? Mm-hmm. But then she is the Falcon now, too, so maybe there's some way to spin that. Right, right. Possible. So def- definitely really exciting. Um, the uh, Now how much would you pay is an interesting one, which I've said, like, <laughs> hey, they, well, that's that's your problem as a streaming service, right? Convince me to pay. And, mm, and right. CBS All Access found a really good way to get me to pay for, what, like six months? I was like, oh, cool, we've got all these Star Trek series lined up that you want to watch. Cool. If there's a whole bunch of Marvel and a whole bunch of Star Wars series that I want to watch, yeah, I, I will throw my pennies down for them. Yeah. I didn't see it, but I see in the some of the pictures from the event, the other names that they had up on the board behind them, they mentioned the Willow series in there. The Indiana Jones logo is up on that stage behind them, but I haven't seen anything about Indiana Jones today. Did you guys see anything about that? No, no. So, I mean, geez, talking about double down, if they want to go with that, right? Hmm. But yeah, yeah. it's, uh, oh, yeah, it's, it says right here, Harris, Harrison Ford to reprise the Indiana Jones role for fifth and final movie, July 2022. Yeah, I think the the one thing we may have talked about in this show was Disney reorganizing its internal departments mm-hmm. so that the, the content production had absolutely nothing to do with distribution. Whereas before, it was like, all right, cool, like, this is the project that is doing um, Black Widow and we want this to be in distributed as a movie so we're building it with movie ideas in mind right and mm-hmm. just follow all three and instead they reorganize and say no 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 content you go decide how to make good content and totally different people will figure out how are we distributing it right so that they're like all right well this movie it would make more sense to put out in theaters or this movie it would make more sense to make that a streaming exclusive yeah um, and I, I think that's what's what's happened here with them and it's pretty well timed given what we talked about with hbo that like a pandemic pandemic is a really good time to have tons of content on your streaming service yeah. and, and just say, all right, bite the bullet and call it good and say, forget it. Uh, we might be able to put some stuff out in theaters internationally, but one of the biggest markets in the United States is very clearly not going to be certain to be in an okay spot COVID wise through 2021. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was a really, really good reorganization to say, all right, instead of, oh, th- you know, the head of this movie has decided that they, they really don't want to miss their bonus. So they're going going to do whatever they can to, to to put it in theaters and oh no it's a terrible idea it's like no no no. your job is to create content and your job over here is to figure out how to distribute and make the most money yeah and and so they this was a stockholder event so they also released some numbers today too so disney plus subscribers worldwide are up to 86.8 million and it was 74 million last month so they gained almost 13 million subscribers in a month uh, and they also said they are going to be increasing their monthly price by $1 a month to $8 in March. So guess who's paying for that uh, bonus to the executives? Me? Uh, it's us. <laughs> yes, the answer is us. Here you go, sir. Uh, it does mention in one of the stories that uh, Black Widow, a prequel to The Lion King, and Disney uh, Pixar's Luca are all still on track for theatrical releases as of this point. So nice. they're, I guess, still see a way that these are going to be available in theaters i i still find it strange that that's the choice they're making but sure so uh the other piece of news that came out of one of these is that apparently not only is ewan mcgregor returning for the obi-wan kenobi series yes this is weird but hayden christensen is coming back to play darth vader right following up on i don't know how we talk about it in spoilers free zone but uh, given what's talked about with ahsoka and rebels and other stuff it's like oh it would kind of make sense that you'd bring back Hayden Christensen to reprise his role as Darth Vader. But he's going to be in a suit. Well, you know, it's not going to affect his acting or anything. I mean, really. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, won't that be a real uh, kick in the teeth? Like the the I, I do think I like Hayden Christensen in other things that weren't directed by George Lucas and, and, right. and right and and seeing him use his acting skill and not just be a uh, a wooden puppet <laughs> to to move to the director's whims might change a lot of people's minds and like oh actually this dude could have been like or 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 in this case will be a very solid Darth Vader. I'm be interested to see if that happens. So which series of all these announcements are you guys most excited for? For me, anything Star Wars. Wait, what, as a whole, you, you got to pick one if you're going to do that, right? Like, I got to pick one. Yeah, you got to yeah. pick which 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 individual project out of all <laughs> these. Maybe one Star Wars and one Marvel. Well, Obi Wan Kenobi because it's, I think it's a cool character. Yeah, uh, I, I'm concerned about the villain in that one. Um, Ahsoka is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they they all seem pretty good. If I were to choose one Star Wars one, I'm leaning towards uh, probably Bad Batch because I did like the uh, Commander Cody and um, was it Captain Cody? I don't know the, the the two the blue guy and the yellow guy from from Clone Wars. Um, yeah, Cody and Rex. Yeah, yeah, they, they were pretty cool and taking that idea of of you know this this batch of clones has gone bad and therefore they're more unique and, mm-hmm. and seeing what they do. I'm interested in that and I am interested in Fantastic Four because it is it is not a sequel and is hypothetically the aforementioned attempt to to do it right this time. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the one that has me most curious just because it'll be interesting to see what they do differently how do they how do they make this something that's going to work this time and it can't just be as simple as it ties into the mcu how do they make this work it's it's been done it's right. been done a couple of different times how how why is this one differently why does it work so that'll be interesting but i'm i don't know there's there's so much good to choose from secret invasion seems like it's going to be interesting too so that's the where we sort of left nick fury at the end of captain marvel where he's off in space and he, he's with the scrolls and they've secret invasions was uh secret invasion was a storyline in the comics based on the idea that the scrolls who can change into uh take people's identities basically infiltrate all kinds of places on earth and replace all these heroes so all of a sudden some heroes who you thought were dead are not dead and some heroes who uh you thought were on your side actually turned out to be scrolls in disguise and stuff so it's a really good sort of spy like it sort of fits in with that nick fury kind of vibe too of you know we're paranoid but there really are things out to get us and stuff and armor wars was a really cool storyline in the comics too with um originally it was iron man trying to go around stopping people from stealing his technology and fighting against other armored uh, characters from around the marvel comics universe this one has uh don Cheadle's war machine taking that role but that sounds pretty cool just the idea of you know a lot of pew 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 with war machine versus a bunch of other armored characters sounds like it's gonna be a lot of fun so that one's kind of neat on the star wars side boy i mean it's hard after last week not to want on an ahsoka series um especially because it seems like it's going to spin off of Rebels, which I loved. I am a humongous Rebels fan. So uh, in, the, in the same way that Bad Batch is going to sort of continue the Clone Wars story, Rebels is going to sort of spin into Ahsoka. And it seems like her sort of storyline is going to take her on the same mission that she ended uh, Rebels on. So that's kind of cool. And and Patty Jenkins, uh, director of Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman 1984, is going to be helming this new Rogue Squadron movie for the theaters in 2023. And Rogue Squadron, uh, I read a bunch of the novels for that and then also the comic book series about that. That's, you know, uh, a very, very famous There's video games. Like that's been sort of part of the expanded universe of Star Wars for a long time and and much beloved. Lots of good characters, lots of good stories about this sort of crew of, of pilots and the missions they go on and stuff like that. So that one sounds really, really interesting to me. Um, she's proven she can do big movies and do them great. And I'm really curious to see what it's going to be with her, her moving into that universe. And Willow. Yeah. Willow. Willow. Yeah. That, that'll be quite the lineup, I think, of, of stuff. Um, the, gosh, I know you just said it, and I have actually seen the character in the comics, the the successor to Iron Man. I forget her name. Oh, Iron, Riri. Riri Iron Williams. Heart. Yeah. Not, not the real name. Like, like they, oh, Ironheart. They, they don't, Ironheart. Thank you. That one is interesting because that one feels like, as I understand the character, what if, uh, what if Black Panther's sister, Shuri, Shuri was, uh, was Iron Man? Is, yeah. is what it feels like, yep. right? Yeah, uh, a child prodigy type person who, yep. who takes over the mantle. Yeah, she's essentially in the comics. She's supposed to be smarter than Tony Stark. And in the story in the comics, obviously Tony's not dead at this point, and uh, he, um, you know, sort of sees something in her, and she sort of invents her own armor, and then you know goes on to become her own hero with his blessing, and sort of becomes Iron Man more or less. Um, 
also, again, notable because Riri is black. So, you know, this is a, a premier character portrayed by a young black woman, too. So that's a good milestone to cross as well. And I'm glad they're doing an, an Ant-Man 3 as well. And a Black Panther 2 was also announced. Um, we knew that those were going to come. We uh, made sense for those things. Captain Marvel 2, we knew that they were going to do those sequels. Those were logical. But yep. getting those confirmed, um, they didn't, I don't, didn't see anything about casting for Black Panther 2. So I haven't seen whether they've done any recasting. But uh, they did say that, you know, a couple of little casting things that came out they mentioned that ant-man 3 that one actor is going to be playing kang the conqueror and kang is a very uh good avengers villain from days gone by a time traveling villain so it'll be really interesting to see where that story goes with that uh, as, as the bad guy so yeah this is just i mean this is just a, a bowl of ice cream on top of a bowl of ice cream on top of a bowl of ice cream this is just uh mm-hmm. this is an amazing list no casting for fantastic four there's the outside possibility that chris evans reprises his <laughs> Role human torch, and they just do not even mention it in 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 the universe. Just don't even mention how much he looks like Cap. That would be brilliant. <laughs> you look familiar. Like, no, no, nothing. Never mind. Never mind. Yeah, it could be could be his cousin. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and as we joked about earlier, Tatiana Maslany, who denied to the CBC last week that she's cast as She Hulk, was confirmed as She Hulk today too. So mm-hmm, I mean, mm-hmm. again, good news in one way, but also that's I have a little bit of an ethical question about that one. But whatever. Uh, well, maybe she was told not to say. Anything. I'm I'm sure she was, but like, there's a difference between between you know denial and like flat out lie, which is what she did. I, I have I, as a, as a how do you know? Were you in the room? As a journalist, I have a problem with it. Well, I mean, yeah. I read her quote. I don't think her quote would have been oh. taken out of context, although that's been known to mm-hmm. happen from time to time. But right. yeah. yeah, I mean, this is great. And so, and speaking about uh, you know the cherry on the Sunday, so there's mm-hmm. this a uh, little bit of the story that's interesting. So, in addition to all this incredible bonanza of content disney is also introducing its international answer to hulu by including a service on disney plus free to the subscribers called star and star is going to be out in certain european countries canada and new zealand beginning february 23rd and it is a uh, yeah it's a free edition and it is basically uh it is for the non-mainstream non-franchise brands so shows from fx shows from 20th century and uh, some of their other content. And uh, yeah, it sounds like this is basically going to be Hulu content. So it says, Star won't carry titles from other studios. Instead, Star will only carry TV shows and films from ABC, FX, Freeform, Searchlight, and 20th Century Studios. But that's still quite a list. You know, we talked, we've talked before about some of the back catalog that they acquired when they got 20th Century and also uh, some of the other properties that they have through those partnerships. And then all the ABC content as well. So that's a pretty big plus for that service as well. And it seems like this is going to be sort of the perhaps more mature channel. So not that it was it Disney 18 plus we were joking about or, or speculating about with right. that uh, fake trailer. This seems like it's closer to that. And at the low price of one extra dollar a month, which is what they're going to charge you, irrespective of whether you want this service or not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in Apparently in, in Latin America, they're also adding Star Plus. And Star Plus will allow them to carry ESPN Plus and ESPN content as well. Here, mm-hmm. I guess they can't do that because of uh, sports streaming rights and things. But um, yeah, it's, this is a, a nice little a little addition to this. This is the the cherry on top of a Sunday of uh, of uh, good content. I've stunned you both into silence. You're so impressed. Yeah, it's 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 definitely very interesting to see how this stuff is lining up. Did, did you gentlemen know that I mentioned this already? That there is a Hallmark movie channel. Let <laughs> no. me tell you, it's like five dollars a month or something i'm like nobody ever wanted to pay for that it was always thrown in as this extra thing in your cable package <laughs> why are they charging for this but all right what do I they mean, show on the hallmark channel a romantic show... schmaltzy movies aren't they oh yeah and it's it, it tends to be seasonal like guess what it's all christmas stuff related um right, right. stuff going on right mm-hmm. now just given the winter holidays and then you know it, it schmaltzy stuff that's generally pretty family friendly is about how you, you describe it <laughs> so are you in for that one jaime in terms of collecting them all, I don't think I'll collect that one. But but hold that thought for later in the um, later in in the headlines here because there's there's an interesting one. Yep. Mm. All right, um, let's let's keep the ball rolling here with some more Marvel news. So earlier this week, we got a confirmation of another casting related to the third Spider-Man movie, uh, following up uh, Homecoming and Far From Home. So speaking of gotta gotta catch them all, they are now racking up a lot of 
former stars in Spider-Man movies. They announced mm-hmm. that uh, Alfred Molina is going to be returning as Dr. Octopus. He, of course, was really? the yes. villain in Spider-Man 2 starring Tobey Maguire. And there is rumors going around out there, which, frankly, I believe, that say that Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are also going to be re- appearing in yes, this movie. Yes, we talked about that last couple of weeks ago. Yeah. yeah so it sounds like, uh, I mean, they'd already talked about casting um, Jamie Foxx coming back as mm-hmm. Electro. So it sounds like mm-hmm. they're doing basically a, a Spider-Verse kind of... Spider-Verse, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like they're doing their own version of a Spider-Verse story mm-hmm. where we're going to get a crossover with all these different Spider-Men from all these different, you know, movie franchises, as well as their respective villains. So this sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Will we get Spider-Man Giorgio as well? Uh, you know what? If there was Killy there, I would be 100% <laughs> on board. Killy, yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious if they'll bring, bring back the uh, the Bully Maguire sort of thing, because that's been a thing that's been trending on YouTube videos. Oh, when he's like venomized in, in the third movie? Yeah. And people are using, you know, CGI magic to put him into all sorts of other movies. That is, <laughs> works out to varying degrees of uh, of insanity yeah yeah i uh i was lucky enough to be working in in la at that point and and covered that um press junket and went to that the premiere of that movie to to see it and then interviewed all the stars and i just did not know what to say <laughs> after seeing that scene i was like that's some pretty over the top acting what scene is that it's, it's in spider-man 3 when um toby mcguire's character is the host for the symbiote that becomes comes venom and it starts oh. to turn his personality sort of dark so it's it's echoes mm. of the christopher reeve bad superman and superman 3 i right, guess when you get right. to 3 you have to turn your villain or your hero into a villain for a little while um yeah but instead of shooting peanuts across the bar at 900 miles an hour he decides to like strut and stroll and be a jerk for like 10 minutes of the movie and it's pretty brutal it's some pretty hammy acting you know it's been a long time since i've seen toby Maguire as spider-man i've forgotten the, the stories right so imagine a 30 year old playing an 18 year old yeah yeah and there you go no, no i no i know I, I remember i remember the first movie i don't remember the second or third movie and then of course there was the andrew garfield was the second one right well so he yeah he did the sort of reboots he did the amazing spider-man 2 movies yeah. right with uh, emma stone yeah. as as gwen stacy yeah um and i thought the first one was okay the second one was a bit of a disappointment mm-hmm. um i would have been curious to see how they would have rebounded after that one clearly it was not to be but um i think the which one had the the the, the green goblin with like the the motorcycle helmet on that was the first one that was the first oh, okay. spider-man yeah. with tommy mcguire and uh willem dafoe was the green goblin i mean i like william dafoe but i did not get the whole green goblin thing yeah and he played it uh unusually as is willem dafoe's way Mm -hmm. but um yeah i I wonder i wonder if he'll be back i wonder i wonder where they go like how far they go with this are they gonna make a sinister six by bringing back all the villains from all the different franchises of of spider-man over the last you know 20 plus years i I mean i I think it's interesting and i think it's really interesting because there's also rumors that this is going to happen in the flashpoint flash movie right that they're going to do the different generations of of batman characters and uh yeah it's it'll be really interesting to see you know if this sort of becomes a nostalgia trend too to sort of rope in longtime fans as well as new fans well this next one is me i think right uh, uh yeah i didn't it didn't have a name attached to it so i what streaming thought someone would claim it you know it seems kind of helpless let's let's skip this one Except for the only one i'm interested in seeing is, is shameless oh yeah that's oh this is what's coming up yeah this is this is what's streaming in in netflix coming up and mm. uh, i mean we can hit it real quick um basically this is in canada i believe yeah so of course mm-hmm. we've got sonic the Hedgehog. Mm-hmm. Um, not really interested in that. Of course, Mariah Carey's Christmas special, Euphoria, which I don't know much about. Yeah, that uh, that did really well. It actually uh, the um, Zendaya, who is also plays Mary Jane in the Spider-Man movie. Speaking of that, mm. oh, okay, yeah, she oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, she won the Emmy Award for best performance in a drama for that this year. So it, sure. you know, and I, I like her. So I, I've been meaning to put. It's been on my crave watch list for a while, but I haven't gotten to it. There's some other high points. I was the, the hunt is coming which is kind of a you know horror movie mm-hmm. uh shameless 
season 11. This is apparently the final season. Mm -hmm. Um, The one we were just talking about, uh, Brian Cranston's show, uh, Your Honor, Mm -hmm. uh, which apparently is about something his son does, something bad. There's a Godmother movie. There's a, uh, what's this one? Alien Worlds. I'm not sure. I saw that one the other day. And of course, you you mentioned Big Mouth before. Yeah, but that we'll we'll talk about that more later in the episode. But uh, safe to say, I'm done already. It's awesome. Yeah, (laughs) Captain Underpants. Uh, And of course, the holiday movies that made us. We've we've talked about Mm -hmm. um, movies that made us and and toys toys that made us. us Yeah, yeah, it's a kind of interesting one. Mm -hmm. Um, Citizen, there's a Citizen Kane uh, making of, I guess, coming out, or is that a retelling of Citizen Kane? So is that Huck? That's the the. that's the story. Mank. Oh, Mank. Mank. Sorry, Mank. Yes. That's the story Mank. about the guy who worked on that um, movie. Yeah. yeah, and that one's another one that it, it, I guess they put it out in theaters, but it's coming to Netflix in mid-December. Mm-hmm. That one is, they're talking about that one as a big Oscar contender. So that, I think, is, oh, really? is yeah. going to be worth a, a look, I think. Huh. Mank, yeah. And Freaky seems like a horror movie, a slasher movie. And then Black Bear, I'm not sure what that one is. But... Oh, yeah, Black Bear. That's um, Aubrey Plaza. That looks interesting, too. Yes. I, I really enjoy her as well yeah yes very interesting actress Mm -hmm. and the next story i just put this in here for uh for color commentary basically um it it may people may already know about this but bob dylan had had decided to sell his entire musical catalog to universal music which basically you know for billions and billions of dollars was it 300 million yeah i I didn't actually hear the number but carol did and she said that that um it doesn't say in the article here what what this is undisclosed now but um carol come asked why like you know is he sick is he dying whatever and i just you know it's sort of i think this is just sort of your your cashing out or whatever maybe there's yep. some reason why and uh, apparently um dv nix from uh, fleetwood mac has also put her uh, a slice of her catalog up for bids as well yeah so that just i just heard that today so well but it, i think I mean, what it comes down to too tim is that when we talked about this i think maybe outside of this podcast but a lot of the revenue that these artists would have gotten in the past from radio plays yeah, and all up, these yeah. other in album sales and everything else is just gone so yep. I think as far as legacy, that's where the money is now is is yeah. the publishing yeah. rights. Yeah, for sure. And if you still own your the rights to your music. I mean, a lot of these young, you know, the Beatles, for instance, didn't know enough to, mm-hmm. they were just having fun making music, you know, mm-hmm. and Bob Dylan is of the time, but somehow he, he, he held on to his rights, I guess, you know. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of stories about bands in the 70s and 60s who just, you know, gave away their music. You know, Willie Nelson famously gave away, you know, tons of songs mm-hmm. that uh, he, he was very prolific. But, you know, he was also a troubled young man and, you know, needed the money yeah. at the time. And, and they would offer him something, some some paltry amount, you know, which to him was like King's Ransom at the time. And, you know, yeah. unfortunately. So it's interesting to just an interesting story. I mean, Bob Dylan, you know, some people say he's the most prolific or the, the most interesting writer in America mm-hmm. or American music, you know. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, he's up there with Simon and Garfunkel in terms of, you know, quality of, of prose, as it were, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, off to Jaime Land for the next story yeah we we got all excited about hbo max and getting all of the the warner media stuff for 2021 um you know who's not excited uh fair <laughs> number of the directors and actors and etc and we'll, i think we'll talk about this for different pieces but uh, christopher nolan in particular <laughs> called hbo max the worst streaming service ever and denounces the plan <laughs> from warner brothers and i think you know th- there's certainly an a, an angle of prestige that i think he's mm-hmm. you know probably getting at it, it took a long time for people to realize that television could be prestigious uh, mm-hmm. after netflix really helped you know sort of crack the the old guard of, of of that being like the lesser place that you would never ever see certain actors and actresses right mm-hmm. um and i think the same thing will end up having to happen for for movies and films that go streaming first as well and the the other thing that i hadn't really considered is like oh nobody could have foreseen to write these contracts that you know people are losing out of money of like hey we get a certain percentage of box office like yep. there ain't no box office it's part of hbo it's like, oh uh wait what like that that's not good so I'm, I'm hoping that hbo i'm not a lawyer i don't know if they're legally contractually required is they really should do them a solid and then everybody going forward to say okay let's write the contract so regardless of what happens here's what we we know what we're getting into and we know what we're getting paid yeah which is the the other part of it well and it's nolan has made comments in the past too. like he's a real sinist like he believes mm-hmm. in movies 
movies in movie theaters and he makes movies for movie theaters and he's been disdainful of of the movies outside of the theater experience for years he talks he's talked about it for since his career started so i think the, the he sees this as a slight on the art of filmmaking he sees this as diminishing and but i mean talk about biting the hand that feeds you i mean these are the guys that that put up the money for tenet these are the guys that put him uh gave him three batman movies to make these are the guys who are uh, guys people who uh you know have basically funded the last dozen years of his career 15 years of his career and he has just <laughs> just ripped them a new one in these pieces <laughs> It, it's so weird because, uh, you know, you look at what happened with Tenet, right? And given what we know about the rule of thumb or for budget versus uh, grossing at the box office, it lost tons of money because mm. we know that you normally take budget and say triple it and you probably start breaking even at that point with marketing costs and, and all that stuff, mm-hmm. right? So the budget was somewhere around $200 million. Given the will they, won't the pandemic thing that happened, it only grossed $359 million worldwide. So it is well short of the 600 you would expect to start breaking even on in any normal year could maybe have been an 800 million 900 maybe billion dollar movie mm-hmm. um so i i don't think there was a uh you know with with, with a twinkle in their eye and smiles on their faces when hbo <laughs> said like hey we're gonna warner we're brothers say hey we're gonna take this stuff and put it on hbo max i think it was just the, the pragmatic way of dealing with all of this content that they had backing up. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, and, and as we talked about before, they have to recoup some money somewhere in order to fund the next thing too. So it is what mm-hmm. it is. If you can get people's subscription fees, even in in short bursts, I mean they're not they're not doing exactly what I mean. I suppose they could. They're they're dropping like what is it, seventeen, eighteen movies? They have said that will be the theatrical quality movies that are going to end up on HBO Max next year. You could make a case that if they if they time them correctly, you would want to have a subscription for the entire year next year to, to maximize be able to see all those things when they drop and then be part of the zeitgeist on them but it's still not anything compared to what disney's doing where it's you know it, disney's on pace to be week to week right like right they're, they're, they're gonna be you know you have to have it 52 weeks a year whereas hbo max is looking more like you could have it for a month and then drop it for a month and have it for a month and then drop it for a month but hbo's always sort of been like the higher tier of, of online you know cable servicing kind of oh they're content they right? are prestige television they have been prestige television long before anybody else even dipped their toe in the water. Uh, right, yeah. And they still are producing, you know, very high caliber programming. Well, they started the whole sort of on-demand kind of service, right? Like, I mean, the whole home box office by itself title, right? Says, says it all. Yeah, although they've gotten a little bit away. I mean, originally it was a mix of a little bit of original content and a lot of movies, right? And now right, right. they're not really, they're they're making their own movies. That's where sort of that comes in, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, the other thing that I tagged on the bottom there Jaime is uh is apparently the decision to go with this uh streaming of movies and taking them out of the theaters is not just rankling directors because the AMC film uh movie distributor uh theater chain I guess in the United States uh they went off <laughs> they went off last week as well um they were livid they uh think that this hybrid distribution model where they're putting it out in the theater but they're also putting it on their streaming service is, is basically just going to murder them And so the quote from this is uh, Adam Aaron, CEO and president of AMC Entertainment. Clearly, Warner Media intends to sacrifice a considerable portion of the profitability of its movie studio division, movie studio division, and that of its production partners and filmmakers to subsidize its HBO Max startup. As for AMC, we will do all in our power to ensure that Warner Brothers does not do so at our expense. We will aggressively pursue economic terms that preserve our business. So, yeah, they're not happy about this decision. They think that uh, if people can stay home they will and they're probably not wrong so um you know this is again another another brick in the wall of you know the demise of movie theaters as we know them right 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 yeah and these guys recognize it it's really hard for them i i do think their model will have to change that it's not um every movie comes to the some rinky dink little theater that happens to have an amc franchise it'll be no 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 you go to the the event place that has the really good you know double double um IMAX size with you know it, you can smell and they give you food so you, you can eat exactly what what the flavors and scents should be like mm. um it will be like a full experience a premium sort of thing um and 
and I was thinking about like, oh, you know, the one thing you're missing out on when you, you watch something like a Wonder Woman 1984 in the comfort of your own house. I mean, yes, it is true. You get to save a whole bunch of money on popcorn and other stuff. But you know what you also don't get? You also don't get the, you know, branded popcorn cup and yep. you don't get the, <laughs> whether you even, whether you even pay for it. Like I not even saying like the ones you can buy that are kind of like memento souvenir ones. I mean, just literally like they, they, they print it out on the paper cup. Like, here you go, Star Wars or 1984 Wonder Woman. I think there's an opportunity here where I think they should, uh, they being like HBO in this case, should probably cross promote this with like Jiffy Pop or Overall Redenbach or something of like, hey, <laughs> you know, we could send you a coupon. We we know where you live, not in a creepy way, but like billing wise, we know where you live. We could send you this coupon or, or give you a, a digital coupon that you can go get at the store and get your collective commemorative cup they have you know that they sell at uh your, your local grocery store mm-hmm. yeah yeah i don't know it's uh it is looking a little grim for the fate of movie theaters because i don't know how long they can just sustain really really what looks like it's going to be tremendously low attendance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know 2021 is looking very much like a write-off at this point and you know after already missing almost all of 2020 and now looking like they're going to miss a good chunk if not all of 2022 or 2021 how how is that sustainable as a business model like that's a lot of real estate what do they do like how do they how do they keep that going yeah how do they do that indeed well let's talk about a video game then (laughs) well what they do is they make movies like the metal gear solid movie of course uh we talked about snake Snake. they talked (laughs) about uh oscar isaac is going to be the star of the moon knight series on disney plus well he's also now been cast to star in the metal gear solid movie uh this has been rumored for a while it has been something that they have talked about wanting to do. It's obviously an immensely popular video game franchise and, and has been for 20 plus years. Um, Tim, I know you you were a big fan back in the day and, mm-hmm. uh, and I've certainly mm-hmm. played uh, through a bunch of them as well. It seems like it could work. I mean, it's essentially, it's a spy spy story slab mixed with a little pew pew pew. Like, I don't, I really don't see why it shouldn't be a great franchise and, and Oscar Isaac is a good actor. So, I mean, it seems like a good fit. Seems like but I mean, the whole experience of playing that game and the reality of what, you know, the, the character in the game is doing, I, I don't know. I was more into the game mechanics when I was playing the game. Like, you know, same with same with Tomb Raider. It wasn't so much about the story or that blew me away or the cutscenes or what have you. It was just about the mechanics of the gameplay. Yeah. You just like beating up the bad guys and stuffing them in lockers? Well, yeah, but I, I don't know how you, like, you know, I don't know how you, I mean, like with Tomb Raider, like, you know, one of the, one of the levels right in the first game is you shoot monkeys and you shoot lions and you shoot wolves i used to just run past them <laughs> like you know like I, I get the whole yeah oh, i get to kill shoot these things but by the same token though i like you know i was more interested in the game the puzzle puzzle solving than, yeah than you know running around shooting things right yeah so, which is why i don't play call of duty and all those kind of things right so yeah although i think i think you you can do that well in a movie i think honestly i think that lends itself more to a movie experience than just the pew 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 yeah. right you're right well, i think mean, call of duty movie is with just a controller pew-pew-pew. and make oscar Isaac, you know, climb fences and leap, you know, tall buildings and stuff like that might be a different thing. That's, that's what I'm saying. I don't know how you'd put that into a movie, like the feeling of, of you know, controlling this, this like it's like having an avatar that you could move around on the screen in front of you. Right? Yeah. Although I think the, the one thing that really made those games for me was the tension, right? So much of those yes, games exactly. is about what's going to happen next and, and having to be stealthy. And just, I think really what it needs to be done is not just a pew 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 movie. It needs to be a bit of a thriller, right? It needs to be on an edge of a seat yeah. kind of movie. Yep. And I and I, I hope that having realized the success of the franchise, they can take it in that direction. But yeah, what they need to do is just sort of ratchet you up so that you're in Snake's shoes and you're feeling, you know, is he going to get caught this time? Is he going to get caught this time? Is he going to have to fight his way out? Is he going to be able to sneak his way out? I, I think they can make it work with a little bit of good writing. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know you probably haven't seen, um, what's it, uh, Hill Die Repeat? Uh, um, no. Yeah, I mean, the, that... <laughs> Take, take for a minute, if you can just free your mind of the actor involved and just 
just think of like Emily Blunt, right? I love Emily Blunt, and I and I've heard okay. that that movie is excellent in spite of its well, it is, it is it is excellent because it 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 plays like a video game, yeah, right? Like like you know, uh, this this character goes through this scenario and he keeps dying, and then every time through the the scenario he gets a little further, and it's it's a bit of Groundhog Day in a sense too, right? Which is very much like playing these video games is, like you said, like you know when you're playing Snake in the game, you're not going to survive all the way through on the first go, right? Uh, and you're going to keep going back at going back at it and get better and better and better. And that's kind of sort of how that, um, I forget what it's called, but it's not, it, Ready, re, Kill, Die, Repeat is what they renamed it, but it had a different name before. Yeah, Edge of Tomorrow, um, wasn't it? Edge of Tomorrow, that's what it was, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it was um, it was an interesting movie because it had a sci-fi sort of plot behind it because it, it's actually the aliens that make you feel or experience things this way. But, but that was, to me, that was the closest thing to playing a video game in a movie that I've seen, you know, mm. other than, say, the last episode of uh, Twilight Zone this season or, or Groundhog Day, which sort of bor- borrow from the same sort of thing, you know, mm. like that the more times you go through it, the more experienced you are, right? Well, what was that? The the one that Black Mirror did, the Bandersnatch, felt like that as well. Right. That yeah. sort of choose exactly. your own adventure. Yeah, well, Bandersnatch, you actually played through the, by with your remote, like, yeah, yeah. you know, which is cool. What about you, Jaime? Are you a, a Metal Gear fan? I am, and I'm kind of wondering, like, I think the, the, the spy intrigue, so for folks who are not familiar, if you take Snake Plissken from Escape from New York and make him do more um, sneaky Rambo stuff, uh, you kind of get an idea of what the flavor is. But that's that's the more realistic stuff. The very bonkers and bananas directions that the movie, sorry, the game series story takes is kind of going to be interesting to see how they they take that in with like the the Patriots and Sons of the Patriots and VR missions and, and other mm-hmm. stuff that, that gets real wild real fast if you play the games. So mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder if they'll do a more grounded approach to it. Um, and, and even grounded, <laughs> if you're going to stay true to the series, gets real nutty real fast, um, even for the more realistic uh, parts of the franchise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think it could be good. I'm, 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 I will definitely pay attention to this one anyways. Uh, speaking of comic book franchises and uh, sci-fi franchises, we got another new CW show. So it seems like everything now is a CW show is going to be a, a DC <laughs> property. So they have announced they're going to do a series based on a DC character, a relatively new DC Comics character uh, by the name of Naomi. She is uh, also mm-hmm. a young black woman. So again, yay for progress. It uh, is also going to be helmed by Ava DuVernay, who is um, uh, working on the DMZ series, at HBO Max, and she's apparently working on a New Gods movie related to DC Comics. So she is sort of, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of coming of age sort of comic book stories this you know young woman discovers she has powers and then she leaves her small town and sets out to sort of make her way in the world with you know sort of discovering how to be a hero and all that stuff so it's a winning recipe and uh and a very successful comic she's only been around for two years uh brian michael bendis famously creator of uh miles morales and um uh, riri williams and a lot of um uh characters over the past you know 20 years or so as a writer, he created the Ultimate Comics Universe, um, which is a sort of font of great characters, uh, created the character, and he is, uh, you know, yeah, he, he seems like, you know, all his ideas are getting mined now for um, for content, and, and now this is headed to the CW, so I guess we'll see if this also works. It is interesting to see if it's going to tie in to the other DC properties, if this is going to be a thing, or if this is uh, sort of a standalone story as well so seems like that yes. the cw yeah. is committed to being in the dc comics business even more and more every day right cool and speaking of you know coming of age and getting really sexy and stuff. <laughs> okay so we were talking about the hallmark channel and and who would pay for this um in a very similar vein the lifetime channel which you might know as the uh the the the, the channel that almost always has like abusive husbands or boyfriends or otherwise women being put in very predictable uh, very uh, difficult predicaments. They somehow were convinced by what I can only assume was a very, very large bag of cash. They were convinced by the KFC folks. The uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken is going to have a uh, a recipe for seduction. The movie starring Mario Lopez as <laughs> Colonel Sanders... <laughs> Prior to him developing the uh, the the secret recipe, and as he's got this torrid romance with a young heiress. <laughs> 
Um, I, yeah, I, when I, I saw I the picture of this, this out I thought this was a, a chicken commercial. When I saw the commercial, you, or when I saw the, the picture, I thought it was a joke until the people were like, and one of the questions I saw was like, is Mario Lopez I owe somebody money or like what? How did this happen? <laughs> is he into the Colonel for like a couple million or something? Like it's a it's a fifteen minute long soap uh, soap <laughs> opera that will air on Lifetime uh, on Sunday. Well, seriously, like I, I, I mean, I've seen the commercials and uh, that's all I need to see, really. <laughs> You know, at 12 it's a commercial for Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? It, it is. And I, I will be very disappointed if they do not give you like a coupon or some other sort of thing at the very well, end so, of the of the, the show. So, I mean, I mean, and they've been doing this for the last couple of years. They've had pretty famous actors playing the colonel. You know, I think yep. um, Jim Gaffigan uh, was, was Nor- the colonel. Norm, uh, Norm MacDonald played yeah. him. Uh, Jim Gaffigan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, like like you can see, like, you know, they'll get a Zach Galifianakis to play him in next, you know, kind of thing. Um, but yeah, just sort of funny people playing him and and uh and and you know bringing their own sort of universe to it you know so and when i saw mario lopez doing that i just thought it was funny that that he was like the colonel with his secret recipe of herbs and spices you know <laughs> well he'd be herbs and spicy i guess <laughs> yes yes he got you know apparently you know what i assume is blending and reblending the was it 18 herbs and spices to come up with the perfect match apparently that's a lot of work because he got hella jacked <laughs> by just you know right. uh, doing all that 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 churning of everything and i i am curious to see if this works and 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 if it is successful what other things might we see uh you know is there an mcu style play here where you know um <laughs> you mean KFCU? yeah yeah because i was like trying to think it was all right well, well who are they owned by is like well they're owned by by pepsico right and pepsi owns like a ton of stuff yeah. right so uh uh you, you can imagine the the end credit scene where there's somebody like, so, Mr. Sanders, uh, we're building a team here, <laughs> but we're going to have to make a run for the border <laughs> to yeah, be oh, yeah. up for the folks. <laughs> Those, you know, get, get Taco Bell in there. Um, Wait, does, have you heard about this organization? Was, didn't right. they have the Chihuahua max, mascot? The talking yeah, Chihuahua? Yeah. We, we, we got to make a run for the border. There's a there's a secret organization only known as The Hut. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I started losing track of what else besides Pizza Hut and Taco Bell was owned by uh, uh, by PepsiCo, but but you could see it happening. Everybody's absolutely. everybody wants a cinematic universe nowadays, so I I see no reason why it couldn't yeah. happen here. Yeah, at least you want to have a cinematic universe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, people may say, oh, well, what about like Ronald McDonald and the Hamburger? I was like, no, 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 that's a different. It has to be a different franchise unless they do like this epic crossover, like <laughs> you know, Disney and and uh, the Looney Tunes coming together in Roger Rabbit, which is like the only time that has ever happened. Um, all right. So mine's real quick. We, we've been talking about a lot about the James Bond movies in the last little while, and and there, you know, there seems to be um, they've, they've, YouTube has now set started showing all 19 Bond films on f- for free on the, on YouTube in the U.S. Hmm. That's so weird it's, that it's it, only. I'm like, I'm sure movie rights are difficult and etc. But why only in the U.S.? Very strange. I don't know. Of course, ours are are available through our subsidized uh, <laughs> sci-fi here. You can watch all of the Bond movies are now on Crave. So. Are they, yeah, yeah, they literally created the a free channel. crave or the paid for a crave. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure, but I did notice. I think it's the paid for the other day that uh, that there is a sort of a stream on their feed now that basically says Bond and it has all yes. Bond movies. Yeah, and are they 4K ish? Uh, no, nothing. I think on Crave is 4K. That, but I thought they. But you, didn't you say the Blu-ray? They're all Blu-ray though, right? Well, they did restorations, but in order to get the 4K ones, you either need to buy the 4K Blu-rays or or I think maybe uh, stream them on Apple or or purchase them from Apple. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah. So we'll have to check it out. We'll have to turn on our um, our tunnel bears and uh, <laughs> away we go. Yep. Tommy, you got the last one here. Last one here is I can't believe in 2020 people are this dumb to allow a movie to release knowing what cultural norms are that are different now. And with China being a massive market that everybody wants to pander to, I am shocked that they didn't have sensitivity training before releasing this movie. I am talking about Monster Hunter, which apparently uh, its theatrical debut in China has gone disastrous and that the movie has been pulled, given that there is a line that that seems kind of racist for uh, 
reasons that are not clear as to why they left this in the movie or even put it in where a character says look at my knees what kind of knees are these chinese oh, which is no. not only i really don't like it's i'm laughing because it's, it's so bad it's 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 hilarious right uh, i don't understand why somebody thought hey let's put that in the script hey let's have an actor say it and let's actually leave it in the final version of the film but the, the chinese are bad understandably so this this probably would have gotten some attention in america and apparently there is going to be a new cut that comes out that removes that so they can put it back into theaters this is an american movie i believe it is an american movie i don't wow. remember how insensitive who finances this it's so complicated <laughs> nowadays <laughs> But it's, yeah. it's it's hilariously wow. dumb to to miss out on all this money because you had to leave in a, a really a childish <laughs> race related pun for you that that's offensive to your largest potential market. Woof. Yeah. yeah, that's not so good. All right. Well, by the way, who's doing the recap this week? That would be me. Me. Okay, you. All right. Well, kids, it's that time of the show where we start to dissect and yeah, dissect. I guess we'll just we'll dissect it. We'll, we'll take it apart. We'll we'll pull it apart. We'll you know poke holes in it. Uh, Star Trek Discovery. Season 3, Episode 9, Terra Firma. Hmm, I wonder what that means. Um, so off you go, Jonathan, with the recap. Yeah, uh, well, this one is the episode that's been building for a little while. We knew that there was going to inevitably be a uh, What the Hell's Wrong with George Out episode, and, and we finally got there. So here we go. So the episode starts with uh, Culber in the medical bay, and he's having a conversation with Kovic, the secret uh, Section 31 S agent um, who uh, we saw four episodes ago who was interrogating George Ao and they're talking about how he is uh, he's, he's basically outlining what they knew that this was going to happen and he tells the story about this uh, alien named Yor who had time traveled from the year 2379 and they discovered that his uh, his time travel had sort of messed with his body and was basically like you know driving him insane and in so much agony that i guess they had to euthanize him or they were advocating his euthanasia because it was uh it was so awful and they say that you know what's going on with george Zhao is that her body is fighting to either go back in time or go back to her own dimension or both but either way it's not going to be able to survive where they are now so um again i think we knew that given that they were talking about doing a section 31 george Zhao series in the future that somehow they were going to have to write her out of this show. So so here we go. Um, George Ao is struggling. We see her in the mess hall and she is starting to lose her ability to touch things. Uh, she reaches over and tries to grab her wine glass and can't pick it up. Her hand is sort of phased through. So she's non-corporeal at times, which is really weird. Tilly, who uh, is ever the, you know, uh, the bigger person, decides, you know, I will go and I will sit with George Ao in the mess hall and I will, you know, bring her uh, a little bit of, you know, camaraderie. And uh, and George Ao gives her a withering look and sort of says, you know, you're you're going to be the one who causes the death of this ship. I can't believe Saru picked you. Maybe you will be Killy after all, which referencing her uh, her Terran counterpart, who was this, you know, maniacal, murderous person. And then proceeds to uh, when she's, you know, Tilly sort of points out, hey, you know, we know you're struggling. We can deal with this in a you know private and respectful way. We can help you if you're struggling. We saw I saw you couldn't hold your wine glass, and she says, "Well, yeah, well, watch this," and grabs the bowl of soup and dumps it on on Tilly. Um, you know, bit of a bit of a dick move, which you know, yeah. she's she's lashing out. Obviously, she's scared, and she sees her her end coming. Um, Burnham shows up and says, "You know, okay, time to stop pouring soup on my friend here. Let's let's head down to the the uh, sick bay. The doctor wants to." Talk talk to you down there they uh reveal to her that there is a possibility that something can be done about her condition the the uh ship that is now merged with the sphere and has sort of become this all-knowing uh oracle of everything has uh told them that if they go to danis 5 which is near the gamma quadrant that there is a five percent chance that they can save her life as opposed to a zero percent chance if she 
she stays where she is. They have a conversation with Vance and Saru there as well. Vance, the Admiral running Starfleet. And he uh, he sort of says, well, the Emerald Chain is conducting training exercises nearby. But, you know, uh, you know, we probably should be here. And Saru says, yeah, well, it's my call. And I say, no, we sh-, you know, in this case, it's the good of the many versus the good of the one. And when we can't we can't do this. And Vance overrules him. And I think I was a little surprised by that move, although, you know, for plot, it had to move forward. But Vance sort of says to Saru, you know, if you if you didn't do this, the crew would never look at you the same way again. So you got to do it. You have to take the chance and take the ship and go. Yes, you have one shipmate that's drowning. He said. Yeah, it's a good analogy. And, and again, it's a bit of a strange. I mean, Vance has been, I guess, softening a little bit to the crew. Maybe he's warming to, to the disco. And maybe he's happy about them retrieving the burn data and everything else. But he was a real hard ass three episodes ago. And now he's like, uh, take the ship. That's our one hope for getting across the galaxy and go have a good time. You crazy kids. It's funny. You know, I had yeah. a feeling he would, he was going to turn like, like, a, I don't know what it was. Maybe the way he was delivering his lines or something that I just sort of had a feeling he was going to say, yeah, you know what? Go. Yeah. So we go down and we see Georgia is down in the, the, uh, the workout space and she's, you know, sort of beating the tar out of things. And she decides that, uh, you know, well, and the other thing Vance sort of says is, you know, uh, you know, Terrans are, are, you know, they want to go out in a blaze of, or is it, is it, is it him that says that? Or is it, uh, Kovic that says that, <laughs> wants to go out in a blaze of glory? I think it's Kovic no, says it, it. Yeah. Says, you know, you yeah. got to be careful because Terrans want to die gloriously in battle. Yeah, don't, don't tell her she's going to die because she'll take you out with her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, Burnham goes down to the training room with her and sort of says, you know, hey, you know, we're going to do this thing. And George Al sort of turns on her and, and sort of, you know, is now challenging her to a duel to the death. And then they start fighting. She picks up a sword and looks like she's going to take a swing at, at uh, Burnham's head and, you know, is screaming at her, fight me. She wants, she wants, you know, a glorious death and she's fine with Burnham being the one to do it. In the end, she, you know, swings the sword, holds it back, doesn't do it. And, you know, she still has this soft spot for Michael in spite of the fact that she uh, obviously has these complex feelings for her being the spinning image of her daughter from the Terran universe. She finally says, fine, let's, all right, I'll take the chance. We'll do this thing. So they give her this bracelet uh, the bracelet of death where basically red means dead if it turns red you're gonna you're gonna die um i love that in the future that's as far as technology has made it is basically a fitbit that right. changes three colors but uh they basically the, say the mood ring yeah right, exactly the they, and they basically say okay we're, we're we're gonna do this thing let's let's go do it we do our our intro credits we come back and uh we get a little bit of a, a sort of a you know farewelly kind of thing again signifying to me that this is sort of the last hurrah for George Ao on the ship. She says goodbye to Saru, and there's actually some respect in her voice, which is surprising considering she's had a lot of disdain. I think she does, uh, at her core, really respect him. And then Tilly, in spite of the fact that she was souped just like hours before, uh, gives George Ao a hug, and George Ao finds herself, you know, even sort of hugging back a little bit. We see uh, George Ao and Burnham beam down to the planet, and it turns out it's the Canada planet it's just like wintry yep. and there's snow falling and it's uh tundra and you know i was like oh just because you guys are filming here doesn't mean you have to show that i mean come on but one one comment that I, I i thought was kind of interesting about that scene i don't know if you noticed or not but you know when when you have finely packed snow mm. you know and, and it's the same thing when i when i see sands scenes scenes where there's sand like dunes and stuff like that is how did they get to where they were because if you look i, I think i know how they they did the the video trickery but there's there's no footprints yeah. leading to where they are in the middle of this this uh, snowfield, yeah. right? And as they walk out, of course, they're making footsteps. Yeah. So kind of a cool fact. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they just they take them out in uh, in computer technology or if they literally. No, they had a motion controlled camera. Yeah. right. That would have filmed the would would have filmed the motion of you know as the camera pans away. Mm. Then they would have put the actors down there, and then they would have had them walk on the snow, and then they would have taken the two halves of the yeah. images, yeah. and they would have put the pure snow. So there were there were in fact footprints there but they they masked them with with two two takes with the motion control camera yeah cool mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so while they go off on their wander through the tundra trying to figure out why they're there we cut back to disco and we're into engineering where adira is busily working on trying to create the algorithm that is going to help them figure out uh the mystery from the previous episode which was
because there is this distress signal and it's coming from inside this nebula and it seems to be a Starfleet signal. She's working on that, but she's frustrated and she's clearly on edge. Uh, Stamets comes over and says, hey, uh, you know, take it easy. You're clearly, you're tired. You forgot you're to set the delegate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and basically says, you know, you don't, don't, don't smash my stuff, lady. And, or excuse me, person. And, um... She, sorry, she, they, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get there. Uh, they are very frustrated that they're struggling with this algorithm. Stamet speaks to them about the fact that, uh, you know, they haven't heard from Gray and Gray is still missing and uh, they are struggling with uh, losing that connection to Gray. And they set this thing so the algorithm is going to sort of, you know, continue scanning. They're trying to get through. And um, then we cut to Saru and book book we remember at the end of the last episode was saying to burnham hey you know i'm in i I believe in this stuff that you've been preaching this whole time i want to be part of the federation starfleet uh, work that you guys are doing and so he flags down saru and they do a walk and talk through the through the halls one of my very favorite things being a longtime west wing fan and they're walking through and book basically says i'm eager to help i want to do my part he confirms to saru some of the whispers that he's heard through the couriers that he belongs to that in fact there is this training exercise that the emerald chain is going to do only he's saying you know just to be clear just because they're calling it a training exercise does not mean it's a training exercise and of course this is an episode after uh you know we had vowed revenge from the uh osira the leader of the emerald chain that she was gonna kick everyone's butt for embarrassing her um in the last episode and saru sort of says you know listen you know I, part of part of what we do here is that you know you can't force these things you you can't rush into things, but I think if you stay patient, that you're going to find your window to prove yourself, and you know you'll find your your groove in all this. Um, I guess there's no Starfleet Academy anymore. They couldn't have just gotten him enlisted. They couldn't have just sent him yeah. back down to the miners well, for a while. He already has a uniform that fits him. So yeah, really. Okay. Like uh, it seems like a natural fit. Mm-hmm. We cut down to the planet, and Burnham and Giorgio are wandering through the the great white uh, north, sure. And they get to a spot where they think the signal that they're trying to find originates, and when they turn their backs, they find themselves looking at a man sitting in an Adirondack chair with a uh, newspaper next to a door to nowhere. And he introduces himself as Carl, and... Because he can't say Q, right? Yeah, pretty much. And he's making weird, bad puns about adorable and all these you know little weird things i wrote down that doctor who vibes it felt like something you'd find in a doctor who episode this sort of weird weirdly dressed person that's out of place in something that probably only cost like 90 bucks to make uh it felt very doctor who to me and well they used to have a lot of portals in in the original series too right like yeah jump through the portals and go back in time which was a great way to save money and, and tell different stories right yeah yeah so yeah that was kind of a weird one and 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 uh, so we're sort of left with that mystery for a bit. We got back to Discovery, and they've gotten this signal decoded the, that uh, Stamets and Adira were working on. And it turns out it is a message from Dr. Issa of the KSF Kileth. Yeah, and it's a Kelpian ship, and they are they have this message that says we are stuck here in the Verubin Nebula, which is where this has been originating, and where they think that the burn started. And uh, Doctor Issa says, you know, we have gotten a signal from Captain Robert Weens of the USS Hiragana Janai. I did not look that up. I'm sure that's an important reference that I I didn't have a chance to to dig into. And uh, they are basically in there waiting for rescue, but it seems like that rescue never came because the signal has been going out for a hundred years and it turns out that they when they look into what their their mission was that they were in there because they were looking into a uh, dilithium nursery so i guess a, a place where dilithium originates and uh so we are now getting slowly to start to sort of piece together more about the the burn mystery this way back down to the planet and there we have the door you know burnham and and georgiao have a, a little argument about whether or not they should be going through the door and georgiao sort of says you know no i know you know michael shut up i know what i'm doing i'm going through the door and she walks through the door and when she comes out the other side she is the emperor again she is mm. back on board discovery and uh her loyal subjects are all chanting terra firma and hail the emperor 
Emperor, and we see uh, Killy, uh, which is, of course, Tilly in her uh, full regalia, which is just never not funny and delightful. <laughs> and she called her Killy earlier. In she the did. Show, right? It was a good little tip of what was what was to come. And of course, we see you know Owo with a big scar on her face, and uh, you know all these different takes on the different characters. Mm-hmm. And quickly, she's you know she's surprised, and you can see that, and you know some good facial acting by Michelle Yeoh. You know she's sort of taking it all in, and her she's acting with her eyes, and she's sort of trying to sort of figure out what is happening here. And she figures out it's the day that they christen the the Chiron, which is of course that monstrous ship from the first yeah. season. Uh, and it's also the same day that Lorca and Burnham betray her, and she sort of you know is is sort of soaking this in she's sort of getting the lay of the land and she is uh you know trying to see if she can figure out a way to do things differently because she has changed in ways that even she i think is surprised by and of course there she you know some familiar faces all in their their terran versions and including we finally get to uh face to face with the the terran version of burnham hello mother and we also <laughs> inside you know their their sort of lounge aboard the ship as they're drinking and fighting and and uh you know threatening kelpians we see that saru is actually aboard the ship as well and saru is one of the kelpian slaves of course it would have never occurred to uh emperor Georgiou back in the day that this is somebody she knows or recognizes but in this case um Mm -hmm. she is quick to defend him when he makes the audacious matter of offering a glass of wine to burnham burnham is going to have him put to death uh or more importantly put to the snack bar and instead she says no i'll teach him a a, you know better lesson i'm gonna spare him but i want him to be my you know uh i'll teach him you know to be my personal slave and he'll wish he was dead so they uh they return to her quarters he's you know brushing her hair and then they have a conversation where she talks about his varahai 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 yeah varahai um which of course is the, the the maturation process and of course they're still uh, subjugated Kelpians. They, you know, they believe that they're meant to be cold, they're meant to be food, and that they're actually doing them a service by killing them when they start to hit this point, um, which, of course, we know has is, is always been nonsense. And Saru is, you know, brushing her hair, and he puts on her big, you know, sun goddess uh, headpiece, and... You know, he. She basically says, "You know, I want you to be my spy. You're going to work for me. I want you to tell me what you know." And you know, she's sort of probing what's going on with uh, Burnham and why why she's making the decisions she is, why she's working with Lorca. You know, she's trying to get more and more into the root of like, well, what did I do wrong? What what drove this wedge between us? Because yeah, what did I miss? Yeah, yeah. like what did I miss? This is a chance to like, you know, this is uh, it's a wonderful life starring Philip Giorgio. So, and when she walks out into the hallway, we see uh, Reese and Owo having a, a sort of a challenge fight you know i want your job so reese is challenging owo for her job and uh and burnham and uh, george out place a 500 credit wager on who's gonna win and of course the wager goes in the, the way of uh george out owo uh plays a pretty nasty smackdown on reese beats the tar out of him and leaves him pretty bloodied and then sort of says that's enough let's get back to work they go to the uh sort of show that's going on there where they're doing the I, I, is there a name for that type of performance the sort of the the, the ribbon With dancing the ropes? no no I yeah know, it's, like, it's, it's like aerials or something it's, it's, i've seen people do that sort of thing for like cirque du soleil and it's yeah 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 that's but they the... they had like a crouching tiger hidden dragon sort of vibe to it which seemed kind of funny given what michelle yo starred in that yeah, very of movie. course yeah so uh, georgia is basically this like um yeah it's theatrical performance using these sort of ribbons uh, ribbon dancing it was a retelling of her victory of, yeah right? basically how she rose from the you know nowhere and became this vanquisher of the klingons and this glorious tale and it's narrated by stamets who is you know in full sort of you know hyper dramatic mode and is sort of laying this out and they unveil the, the chiron this beautiful new ship that is going to be the seat of power for the entire terran empire and we notice at this point too that uh stamets is sort of edging closer and closer to uh Georgiou and he's got a knife behind Behind him, and it looks an awful lot like it's going to be an assassination. And of course, she knows it's coming. Turns the tables, shoves her dagger into Stamets's neck, and he is out of the game. Uh, to which I wrote a two Stamets because it some seemed an awful lot of Julius Caesar in that one. And 
from there, we, you know, we cut to the inevitable confrontation where, you know, Georgia basically has all of her forces surround Michael and say, you know, you're busted. You know, I know what you're going to do. I know what you're going to do to to me. I know that you've been with Lorca. I know that all everything you can't you can't sneak that past me. I know what's going on. And the Burnham, the, the Terran Burnham is, you know, defiant. Execute me if you want to. I don't care. You know, you're you're weak and I've seen your weakness and you've been getting weaker every day and it's time for new new blood and and we get a scene where George Zhao has a sword and it looks like it's going to be an execution she just drags her sword across and then stops it just a bit short leaving just a bit of a small cut on uh, Burnham's neck and she says no no I this is not the way I want to do this I'm going to do this differently and so she's sort of changing the past slash future she wants to see if I spare Burnham in this moment what's going to happen and instead she sends her off to the agonizer which of course we remember from the first season where Lorca spent some time in the, in the good old agonizer, this incredibly torturous uh, device that is supposed to be uh, exquisitely painful. And from there, we're sort of left with a to-be-continued. Uh, this is obviously the first part of a two-part episode uh, where we're supposed to tune back in next time to find out, now that she's made this decision, what's it going to mean? Right. And also, you forgot to mention that Rekha Sharma was back. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Yeah, she was in the in evil empire side. Mm-hmm. That's Landry's character. And we were talking about whether they were going to do a, uh, how they were going to do a dark side or a mirror universe thing in in this scene. Well, especially because right? they, they go out of your way earlier on to say, well, we haven't been in touch with this part of the universe and they've been drifting apart and we get all that stuff yeah. from Kovic a few episodes back that, you know, yeah. oh, that's not possible. So do you think, do you think that Giorgio, who now knows how the future turns out for the Terrans, you think she's going to change because she's obviously gone back in time like she's gone back to you know early days like even before Lorca well Lorca Lorca and Burnham run off together don't they in the in the first series like isn't that how Lorca ends up in in the prime universe Ye- you know bad Lorca yeah although I, I'm I'm not I clear I think where, she where kills Burnham, Burnham. yeah that. I think she kills Burnham I think that's the idea is that she well then how did Burnham come back in like when when Burnham comes back good Burnham comes prime Burnham comes back to the mirror universe she doesn't say, "Hey, wait a minute! I killed you like last week." I think I think Burnham ran away or something like that with with Burnham. Yeah, I think I mean, she runs away with Lorca, Lorca, but I think she was supposedly supposed to be presumed dead. Right, right. Yeah, although no one's seen her body or whatever. But yeah, interesting. But do you think so? Do you think that 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 now that George because she says to her, you know, now we know how how your future and my future end. At least I do. I see the future. She says, right? Yeah. Um, I've seen the future. She can now change the the past of the Terran universe or or is she in some sort of hologram hologram or what do you call it holodeck uh, thing that like, the Q dude set up mm-hmm. you know yeah I mean that's the part I think that is sort of the weirdest part of this episode it certainly is not um, it's not made in any way clear exactly what has happened is she really in that time is this all in her mind is she really in the past is this all like I don't know I mean, you guys can well, throw your speculative dude, theories dude is a time travel dude because like you mm-hmm. know like that portal I think he actually says, how, you know, how do you, like, what is a good looking portal? It's adorable, right? Um, but because he calls it a portal at one point. Mm. But then portal's just you another know? word for door, too. Yes, I know. I, I get that. Yeah. But and it, and you know. who didn't know that when she walked through the door or something, she was going to end up somewhere else? Oh, I mean, of course. Yeah. Like, it was all pretty pretty telegraphed, but then it's still not is it clear. it a time travel portal? Yeah. Like, like, like the ones in, I'm talking about in, in the original series where, you know, um, one one case where the planet was dying and uh, they had this, this doorway you jumped through and, you know, the one with the Mar- Marriott Hartley and Spock, you know, goes back and, and reverses to uh, uh, a Vulcan from you know the old time, you know, mm. and with McCoy in the cave, and and, and he, he he starts to revert as a Vulcan to move towards the more barbaric version of Vulcan. Yeah. Um, and there was the other one, and of course the one with uh, Joan Collins, where they go back in time and they go back to Earth, right? Mm. And Edith Keeler must die. I think is the name mm-hmm, of the episode mm-hmm. or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, what are your thoughts on uh, on on this one? Do you do you have a, a theory on what what's happening to her? I I wasn't sure because. 
I thought, well, this character, I, I wrote down in my notes, it's uh, Patton Oswalt as Mr. Mixipolik from Superman. Yeah. That's what he had a vibe because he got the, 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 the derby Bowler and he hat. just reminded yeah. me of Patton Oswalt, the, the mm-hmm. actor. It did feel very Doctor Who sort of thing. So I said, yeah. oh, maybe this is like a Q or a Q like being like Trelane or something that, that has abilities to mess with this sort of stuff, uh, yeah. mess with reality. I, I'm unclear if, if this is like all in Giorgio's head. I don't know if it's showing you, okay, well, you get to sort of change reality for a little bit, but then we're going to reset it and you have learned something about yourself and everything. That was sort of unclear to me what was happening there. Uh, so it's so not yeah. a strong theory, although leaning towards a Q or Q-like entity. Yeah, I mean, like I say, I, um, I think the, the it's a wonderful life version of, of, of Star Trek, basically, right? You know, if you can go back and do things differently, what will happen, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, th- this episode also gave us, uh, Tim, this is almost a, a, an MTJC thing of like, I wrote in my notes, pair programming helps you find the missing semicolon because Adira had... <laughs> You know, yes. done something that programmers often do is like you she get forgot tired. to set the delegate, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, she's like, oh, the table view wasn't loading, and she feels yeah. it, sorry. Uh, they feel dumb because uh, oh, I can't believe it was a simple thing. It's like it happens. You just accidentally turn this off, and that's yeah. where Stamets noticed. Not because he's necessarily smarter, but because he's got fresh eyes. It's, like, it's mm-hmm. his equipment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's his like equipment. oh yeah, I see yeah. that thing is off. That's that's why. Oh dang it, the missing semicolon. No wonder I've been killing myself for the last four hours trying to solve this bug. Well, they don't read manuals in the future. We already established that. They just give people equipment and expect them to use it, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I wrote that uh, Owo is full on intimidating. Oh, yeah. Uh, very yeah. different in the mirror universe. When she beats up on yeah. Reese, like, holy smoke, she looks like a badass. Yep. Um, and uh, the very beginning of this episode is interesting in that, you know, there is a, a, a faction in the the fan base that doesn't believe the Kelvinverse to be canon, but it is straight up canon. They just hard wrote it in here as, yeah. Uh, all the stuff that Nero did that went back and created the Kelvin verse, that's canon. It, it happened. It is actually part of normal straight up Star Trek discovery. Hmm. What's, what leads you to that conclusion? So they said at the beginning that um, the the incursion, the split in the timeline had occurred when a Romulan mining vessel went back in time. Right. And and that's, yeah. I mean, they did that's everything what except the temporal say, wars, right? Nero and yeah, yeah. They, they, they went everything except say Spock and and Nero yeah. and the the events of Star Trek 2009. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, interesting though cuz again, how do you reconcile that with Navarre still existing, right? Well, I I think what what they must have known is that as I understand that character of Yor, uh, which they said 2379 and he wasn't wearing a 2379 suit. So apparently in the Kelvin verse, right. they don't go off of the season 1 or 2 TNG uniforms until apparently later in in their mm-hmm. history. Um <laughs> right. <laughs> but he, the the character he said had come from a different time and from a different universe, which in this case is right. the the Kelvin verse. So right. that's why he was double messed up because yeah, the disco crew has just come forward in time, um, and and there is historical stuff from uh, um, Star Trek Voyager where you can get time based psychosis or something. Right. You keep going back and forth between time yep. and mm. layer on top of that. This dude came from another universe, and that's why he was suffering so much. And it seems to be that's why George joe is having the same thing she went in time yes like everybody else in disco but she's also not from this universe right right yeah it's it's definitely it's getting a little um complex i mean i mean yeah i mean i mean yeah it's so funny i thought uh the the kovich character was interesting because in the first one he is completely you know stayed and he's very sort of measured and he doesn't give away things easily and this one he's like mr Mm -hmm. open book he went from you know playing his cards super close to the vest to all of a sudden he's you know let me tell you 10 well he was he was in a room with with Giorgio and he couldn't you know give give away too much right? yeah so maybe that's it maybe he felt with with Culber it was relevant and maybe he feels like her life was fait accompli that she was destined to be toast and it didn't matter what they did right mm. so maybe mm. candor at that point is the best route but I, I thought that was an interesting sort of turn too mm-hmm. so good episode okay episode great episode it was a good episode I enjoyed it I, I like I mean, a- the the mirror universe stuff more than most people do i think Uh, i could see why people would definitely have uh issues because it 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 gives the actors a very interesting opportunity to get really hammy right oh yeah uh martin green is a 
completely different person as well as as mirror <laughs> michael that um, makeup yeah. job was outstanding the yeah, black yeah. lipstick and, and wearing the, black stormtrooper oh, outfits so you know, you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah and, and like all the plastic you know um, like all the, the the women leaders had gold but all the sort of you know oyo and and all the other people stamets and those kind of people had like a black stormtrooper kind of outfit yep. on you know minus the helmet of course yeah yeah um uh, i think that that detmer looks kind of like detmer just you know just without the, mm-hmm. the robot pieces but you might even notice in the background uh nielsen is is not a blonde in the mirror universe she's got dark hair a hey, red hair yeah. Right? Yeah. oh was it red okay it was it was darker it definitely wasn't well uh, darker yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah. not her usual blonde yeah 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 and i mean i could just i could never get enough of of killy she's just such a delightful character she's so bloodthirsty mm-hmm. even this episode where she's... she still is a bit goofy though as you know as characters go i mean like you would think like wouldn't she be more stern and more aggressive and she's still sort of smiley and bubbly and with the, with the phaser in her hand right? yeah but i think the idea is that she's supposed to sort of take this sort of perverse pleasure in being the kind of monster mm-hmm. she is right mm-hmm. so you know yeah yeah i'm trying to place the guy who's playing who plays um the carl um isn't he from law and order yeah he has a familiar face i he's like a co- could, like a sergeant kind couldn't of guy quite or... put my finger on it but i know he's a character actor who's been in a lot of different things for sure yeah, uh yeah. what those things are i couldn't tell you yeah no i kind of get him as a as a you know a police chief kind of dude right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah he seemed like uh he, yeah he had one of those faces where you know oh it's that guy mm-hmm. or maybe he's a doctor i'm trying to think of all the regular shows that i would have or maybe er er good old er is that what you used, you used to call it er oh yeah i'm, I'm familiar with er mm. also high on my uh favorite things of all time not watching your favorite not watch list there's a reason why i uh i gravitate to science fiction and lighter fare and cartoons and other things you know i was a journalist for 25 years and uh i've seen some really awful things in my lifetime uh occasionally mm-hmm. firsthand and i don't need to see that on tv i don't want to see uh policemen and firemen and murders and i i that's i'm good i'm good yeah so uh er was never uh never something that was my cup of tea because it just seemed too too close to home yeah cool. let's see anyway i, put, I found a uh, thing on wikipedia that but uh Hiraga Ganai, mm-hmm. apparently a Japanese polymath. What's polymath mean? Like, they do all kinds of things? Or I don't know what it's from the Edo period, apparently. Uh, polymath is somebody who speaks many languages, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Sure Says enough, here, Paul... a person Poly... of wide ranging knowledge or learning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Paul Guilfoyle is the name of the actor who played Carl, best known for playing Captain Jim Brass on CSI Crime Scene Investigation. It says, Oh, yeah. Uh... He made his feature film that? debut in the movie. Howard the Duck in 1986. Yay. What's his name again? Paul Gilfoyle. G U I L F O Y L E. Found him here. LA Confidential. Yeah, he he's a character actor. He's been in a ton of different things, and he is one of those faces where you see him and you're like, "Yep, I know that guy." Yeah, the Good Fight, Primary Colors. Yeah. How did you find him so quick? Is he in the episode? Uh, I went to IMDb and put in Discovery, and then to the episode guide, and went to this episode. No, because they don't often put they don't often put the the. I mean, I did I did the same thing, but they don't often put the people in the current episode up until later. Yep, because this is written by people. This this IMDb. It's not necessarily written by studios yeah well apparently they were on the ball today so there yeah, we go remember tim, a fact check. yeah remember tim that uh it premieres on cbs all access at like midnight i think mm. um midnight pacific so it's like three in the morning east coast i mm-hmm. think so there's been yeah. enough time for folks who, who wake up early or stay up late to to see that and uh, and go look it up i guess yes canada's own sarah Midich was in this one. Mm-hmm. Oh, we didn't get to see um oh kelpian serpent the the one that gets turned into Saru she is um linus oh it's the same actor oh yeah just kelpian servant oh yeah. that's, that's good good to see yeah, that guy getting work that. what's his name <laughs> uh david benjamin Tom- tomlinson all right from now on right up there with sarah midich we love you yeah where he's you're from. a scene stealer uh, let's see where he's from well he's an orphan black is he canadian maybe can we adopt maybe him he's canadian well, let's unofficially adopt him until we can figure out who <laughs> where he's from <laughs> or what he looks like without makeup on nice that's a trick right yeah well he was in short treks male villager <laughs> well, he's done a long, he's come a long way from male villagers, so good for him. Mm-hmm. Played Troy in Orphan Black. Of course, I have no idea who that is. Say, shamefully, I still have not watched Orphan Black. Really? Yeah, mm. it's, again, it's been on the to-do list, but, you know,
know, by the time they got to five seasons worth, it was like, darn, I, I'm so far yeah. behind and it's a commitment, right? Yeah, that's true. All right. Well, with that thought in mind, let's jump to our watch list. And what have you got, Jaime? I've got the uh, Screen Rant Back to the Future pitch meeting. So if you've never seen any of these Screen Rant uh, right. pitch meeting videos, the, the conceit is you have a uh, screenwriter who's doing uh, a movie pitch to a studio executive. Uh, and it happens to be the same you know, actor playing both sides. Um, it's it's all played up for comedy of like, let's describe movies in their most absurd sort of context. Um, and with something like Back to the Future, you get fun things like, oh yeah, so there's this this scientist character and you know he does this animal testing and he works with terrorists. And they're like, whoa, so he must be the villain, right? No, no, he's actually one of the good guys. And, um, <laughs> and, and the premise of this later part of the movie is uh, this kid has to like pretend to uh, you know sexually harass his mom uh, but then the bully comes in and actually sexually harasses the mom and he's like whoa are you, are you sure people are going to want to see this no no yeah 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 it'll be totally good and uh, I, I just like seeing the Back to the Future uh, franchise and, and the, the first movie in particular get uh, get the send up of like yeah it's actually kind of a really weird and absurd sort of uh, concept if you were trying to pitch it without knowing what it would become yeah yeah uh, if you if you think about the pitches for some of your favorite movies they definitely fall apart pretty fast but that one yeah, in particular sure. is uh yeah so there's incest and there's terrorists and yeah yeah cool I, i'm definitely gonna check that one out so guess what guess what canada has produced out of scarborough ontario david benjamin tomlinson no no come on <laughs> he's from toronto i just looked him up and put him in our notes is yeah, he? he's from oh, toronto okay. no i meant oh you meant I the other guy your notes. yeah i'm talking about uh, the, the new voice of bugs bunny yeah i saw that story in the cbc yeah so i saw this this video actually on i think on i don't know his name you know unfortunately he was on uh, on the news the other yeah. day but uh yeah he's the new voice of uh, bugs bunny and daffy duck and sylvester the cat and he's been marvin the martian for a while yeah. so yeah there's a video here video clip here of him um Actually, let's let's do a quick search here. CBC voice of Bugs Bunny. Give this guy some love, some Spotcast love. By the way, did you see my 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 thought the other day that we should have named this this uh, thing? Um, oh, Spock's brain. This podcast, <laughs> Spock's brain would have been a cool name for this. You can always change it. You know, just say oh, it was. Yeah. Well, it was all. We're just like George Lucas. It's always been our intention to do this, right? So. Yeah, you know, we'll just. Uh, but it's not enough to just start it with a new episode. We have to go back and re-record all the previous episodes, but re- reference yeah. ourselves. <laughs> We'll dub it in. Oh, well, we'll just say just say it once now. Say Spock Spring, and then I'll just go in and <laughs> pop your name in the top. Um, uh, Eric Baza is is the name of the kid. Grew up in Toronto, suburb uh, Scarborough, Ontario. Nice. Now he lives down in L.A. and he's been the voice of uh, Bugs Bunny for a while. So it's kind of cool. For him. It's interesting in the video. He shows pictures of himself, like in grade seven, with braces, and he's wearing a Bugs Bunny shirt. <laughs> you know, so nice. Toronto Maple Leafs jersey as well. You couldn't get more more Toronto area than that. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. I just. I, I just did a search for uh, David Benjamin Tomlinson, the guy who plays Linus. He's from Toronto too. Ooh. We claim him. Oh, he is ours. Make, yes, I think we. I think we talked about him before, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't remember him coming up. I. I know we've been fans, but uh, yeah, mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. I, I recognize the face because I think I went on IMDb and. But that picture that you see here on on uh, Memory Alpha is not on IMDb. No, which is, which is no. Strange. It's funny. He's got a more robust profile on the. On Memory oh, he Alpha. played a Vulcan too on on the um, mm-hmm. in the Vulcan Hello. Mm-hmm. Oh, he is all over this. Wear a mask in the Star Trek universe. Someday yeah, he'll be Saru. Nice. Kelpian villager that we saw him today. Yep. I mean, they film uh, in that area, right? So, oh yeah, I imagine this is part of Jaime's CanCon uh, Canadian content rules. Yeah, but it's also very easy for him where they're like, "Oh, well, you're you're gonna have to be here for like three hours in the chair." He's like, "Oh, it's easy. I just walk out of my apartment, go downstairs, <laughs> <laughs> walk about five yeah. minutes, and I'm at the at the chair." So that, that's that's not an issue at all. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, my watch cool. list thing for this week is, uh, as we talked about earlier, Big Mouth season four. Uh, one of my favorite shows. Uh, an, What's your pick a couple of weeks ago? It too? was, and it was. I was about uh, you know how much I was looking forward to it, and it was everything I hoped it would be. It continues to be one of the smartest, stupidest shows I've ever seen in my life. It is so vulgar and disgusting at the same time as being so smart and so thoughtful and so important. Um, there was you know this this season they delved into uh you know one of the characters is transgender and so they sensitively deal with 
with that. One of the characters is biracial, and they did a very uh, interesting storyline around that. Um, there was it's it's such a weird show. There's so much uh, genuine, intelligent, articulate conversation that young people could get from this show to understand sex and sexuality and who they are and who other people are. And then in the same conversation, it is just over the top, disgusting and vulgar and and hilarious. Um, mm-hmm. Like I say, it is the it is the smartest stupid show I've ever seen. And this is on, on the Netflix. It's on Netflix. So I plowed through it on the weekend. It's only 10 episodes and they're only like half hour episodes. So it didn't really take very long. And then um, my eldest son, 17, uh, he is also a fan. So he's been sitting down and watching it one at a time. And I've been watching with him. And we are even on a second watching. I'm killing myself laughing. There's so many funny lines. There's so many funny characters mixed in with, um, you know, just this hyper awareness of itself. But they also they made a point of, you know, making sure that they are, you know, speaking knowledgeably. They, you know, the the cast bring in people who can write sensitively about sensitive subjects. And so, you know, um, there's just all kinds of really, really topical and and smart stuff happening this season. But it's all mixed in with the goofiness. And, you know, your kids aren't careful. They'll come away learning things, you know. I can't, I can't, can't recommend it highly enough. It's it's such a good show and uh, and so well done. Again, it's, it's one of those shows where you get to the end of it and you're just like, more, more. I want more. This is so good. But uh, obviously that kind of genius takes time too. So you, you can't rush these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, luckily they don't have to learn it the way I learned it on my walk home talking to my friends. It means what? You're kidding me. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, and it's, it's <laughs> you know, like one of the episodes deals pretty um, spectacularly this uh, this season. One of the episodes deals with menstruation. And, you know, mm-hmm. you know, the show, you know, in its typical way goes way over the top on it but mixed in with that right. there's some real smart thoughtful important conversations like sciencey explanation yeah well what? not even sciencey but just you know like that this is you know it, it, what they're really good at is just normalizing these things you know oh these weird things you know yeah. The, yeah. one of the characters they, they go to summer camp and one of the characters from between being 12 and 13 realizes that they are uh, a, a young woman and not a young man and so comes back to camp right. and has a new name and is now a girl and is now in the girl Oh, uh, you know, uh, dorm with the girls, and you mm-hmm. know, at first the guys are all like, "Oh my god, oh my god," and then uh, they're in within very short order, it's just normalized, and you know, that's the strength of good television and good storytelling, right? Is that, right, that right, yeah. you know, it's not just, "Oh my god, this," it's just that's how things are, and, uh, and yeah. you know, again, just can't say enough about the writing on this show. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, it's coming up on Christmas time. I just want to say one thing before we go, and that is there are. There's a big debate about, you know, whether or not Die Hard is actually a Christmas movie. <laughs> and there are two types of people, those who know it is and those are who are wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> a Christmas story is actually a Christmas movie, too. Well, you and I used to watch Die Hard around Christmas time back when we were living together. That was a thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. And Christmas story. And Christmas story. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, there's there's not a lot of Christmas movies that I want to watch every single year. Christmas Vacation's mm-hmm. on the list. Christmas Story's on the list. Die Hard is on the list. Didn't it originally come out in summertime, though? Even though it was, like, Christmas-themed? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think I that might be... On, I only saw it on right. VHS. Sorry, I mean, no, I, I think you might be right. I'd, I'd have to look up to see what the, the date was, but that, that sounds about right. And the the two schools of thought that seem to be in conflict as to are certain movies, Christmas movies or not, is there's the very permissive school of thought, which is if Christmas takes place as a major time of the, of the movie, it is a Christmas movie. So this dis- mm. disqualifies things where, like, oh, let's this couple spends a year together it's like well i mean obviously they're gonna hit christmas at some point that's not a christmas movie but <laughs> the vast majority of the movie takes place during they the christmas time hanukkah. frame yeah, yeah so like like hanukkah would be close enough right because it's like right, that same right. christmasy time frame uh the 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 more restrictive kind that says no 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 christmas has to play a critical part that like the plot of the movie could not occur if you took it outside of christmas mm, which which right. die hard fits both right so yes it does take place during christmas and the whole villain plot is dependent on the fact that certain criteria for security are met given it's the, the holidays. It's a little bit more relaxed, mm. right? Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Home Alone definitely qualifies. Um, Gremlins uh, wouldn't make as much sense if it didn't pl- take place during the holidays, right? People are more relaxed and other stuff ends up occurring. Mm. Cool. Carol was telling me about a, a Lego kit that she saw where maybe it was like an advent calendar or something like that where it's like the tower. Oh yeah, I've seen that online. And, 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 and you 
got the bad guy. You got the bad guy. I forgot Hans his name. Gruber. Like, play, Alan, uh, Hans Gruber played by Alan Rickman, and and you pull out a level a level every day, and he falls further and further down the elevator shaft. Yeah, he stay. There you go. Alrighty, well, on that thought, uh, hey, Jonathan, if people want to get in touch with you, where would they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at GPK News. All right, and how many people want to get in touch with you? I'm on Twitter as at Dev with the Hair. My name is Timitra, T I M M I T R A. On the Twitter machine is where you'll find me. And so until next time, for like the 400th time I've said this, uh, we'll see you in, in the future. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Spotcast Podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. not over till you say and see otherwise oh, I Jaime and i will just keep podcasting know, all night it's long it's funny. It, it, it started it started on the other podcast because like for the same reason like like they would kind of just wait for me to say and <laughs> scene and we argue about whether it's end scene or and scene and i think it's and scene from the improv yes right? or or from um no, it's, uh, it's uh john lovitz isn't it and see well yeah and scene but it's also um you know, like uh, I've seen uh, uh, Amy Poehler do it and a few other people. And she, nice. yep. But you're right. Yeah, it is, it is uh, definitely uh, John Lovitz. Acting. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, look, it's first day of Hanukkah today. Acting. Genius. Thank you. Yeah. So, oh, bedtime reminder. Did you see the pictures of Baby Yoda wearing his uh, his yarmulke and his, uh, his full no. ears? It was on, uh, I think it was on, there's a great, one of my favorite feeds on social media is on Instagram. It's a feed called Nerds with a vaginas and mm-hmm. uh they posted that one today of him with his he looks he's dressed up like a little rabbi and it's just oh, it's genius it's so good mm. oh i see for hanukkah hi mate were you uh, spoiled on uh what happened what transpired in the most recent episode of mandalorian i have not yeah. uh I, so oh. I'm, I'm 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 how I'm, did you I'm avoid it dang- very, i'm in very dangerous waters considering that the 15th is coming up just a few days from now so yeah mm-hmm. uh, uh yeah so i i again i i hear it's it's all cool stuff i mean mm-hmm. Stuff like the baby Yoda is just the universe could not hold back that spoiler, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. It feels like you get, you get you get some forgiveness in the the whole online world for that because it's it's just such a a, a big win for them. Well, um, I have two mm-hmm. two friends who are dangerous on social media. One of my friends is here in the city, but he got uh, um, laid off, so he's home. So he stays up until three in the morning Eastern time and watches the episode as soon as it drops, okay. and so. If I wake up first thing in the morning, if I wake up at, you know, uh, 7.30 in the morning and I uh, roll over and I start checking through socials, I have to be careful because he won't put spoilers up, but he'll say things like, oh my God, that was the greatest Star Wars moment of my life. And, and you just be like, oh, now I, I have to figure that out. I gotta, okay, be careful. But my brother-in-law is in uh, Western Australia, which is the time difference is pretty substantial. So he's uh, almost a full half day ahead. And so he will sometimes post things on there and be like you know oh my god this character's debut was so amazing and i'm like just come on man like come on i know you've got australian (laughs) friends too but come on man so yeah now i've learned to try and uh it's challenging because my job is around social media that's what i do for a living and i can't not go on social media first thing on friday morning but man i want to (laughs) i want to avoid it yeah it's it's, it's definitely definitely tough yeah well all i will say is uh if you're a star wars fan it has been a very satisfying season so far and very much something you should prioritize as soon as you get the service yeah 
and and that's why I've been kind of wondering, like, all right, so it is eight episodes. They're about half an hour. So the first season is four hours. Well, some bigger. of them are longer. They actually, they vary. They can be as short as a half an hour and as long as almost an hour or, an, or, or a little big. One of them's a little over an hour. So, oh, okay. So then maybe instead of the 16th, which is what I was considering, maybe I'll subscribe on the 15th and then cut it real close for the January 15th um, debut of, of WandaVision. I'd have to watch that like the day it comes out mm, mm-hmm. and then cancel my service if I decide it's like, oh, no, I can wait for that one and, and binge it all later. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that was among the trailers that came out today, too, is the they did a, a new WandaVision trailer, which gets a little more into sort of what's going on. And there's a few more characters that show up. We see um, Monica Rambo from Captain Marvel, the the, um, uh, the other pilot that is friends with um, uh, Brie Larson's character, uh, Carol Danvers. And um, and it, it's, it's I'm, I'm really curious to see, obviously, a lot of these stories sort of combine original storytelling with some elements from previous comic stories and adaptations and things like that. I'm curious to see which elements it draws from and what's original and everything else, but it looks really interesting, like very, very head trippy. Um, they also put up the the uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier trailer went up today as well, and they put a release date up. That's coming in March, so not too much farther ahead for that one. So you can always, uh, you know, wait till that one runs its course and then watch uh, one, all of WandaVision and all of uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier there as well. Uh, but Loki, they've also confirmed Loki's coming in May. So basically every other month you're going to get uh, a must watch uh, series there and Loki they put the first trailer up for that one again very sort of head scratchy but Tom Hiddleston looks like he's having a great time so um, lots of good content coming to that service and again like it's not um, you know by the time they run it out by the time you go through the full season of of WandaVision starting in mid-January that pretty much times you out to when you have to pick it up for Falcon of the Winter Soldier which pretty much times out to when you have to pick it up for uh, Loki and that's just the Marvel stuff you know like it it really is becoming kind of a must and it's still reasonable again netflix is you know netflix's premium package now is up i think it's 18 bucks or 19 bucks here in canada it's still only i think i'm paying 80 bucks for the entire year for for disney plus like they really are giving you a lot more bang for your buck yeah that's that's one of those things where i'll, I'll have to figure out but given the lineup that they have if a deal comes out this might be the time to go ahead and like all right next deal that comes up just pay for the the six months or a year up front sort of thing mm-hmm. it'll be a little yeah. bit more of a certain sort of uh concept yeah mine did it came up to the auto renew and it was like oh congratulations you've just auto renewed for the next year and i was like that's fine i'm fine that's i'm good i feel like that's an investment worth worth making at this point well, yep, yep. Hope, hope you make it to the 15th without the spoilers, because, uh, man, I, I can't imagine how hard that must be at this point. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I figure at this point, just accept that maybe I might get spoiled for some stuff. But at least if I do this correctly, I could not be spoiled on the final episode. But at least there'll be one episode of The Mandalorian that I'll be watching real time with everybody else. Yeah. Does that mean in a couple of weeks we can talk about all The Mandalorian episodes? Yeah, because we wouldn't be able to talk about it on the 17th because nobody will have seen the final episode so looking mm. like the the 24th yeah eh, we're not going anywhere indeed mm. indeed it's gonna be the quietest christmas holidays ever uh let me leave you all with this final thought that i had given what we were talking about for the recap of like yeah, time travel and different universe like how far does the universe thing go because could we see a scene in season two of picard where it's like hey harry kim good to see you. you've lived a long time oh and he doubles over in pain <laughs> because remember harry kim is not of this universe either uh, spoilers, he got replaced by his yeah. other version, alternate yeah. version for the other Voyager. Mm. So, Oh, yeah, it's just what I think I was... Oh, Voyager. Yeah, because I just watched the episode where Tasha Yar comes back and falls in love with that dude and decides... She finds out that Guinan says, I don't really know you. You shouldn't be mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. True, true. That's uh, yesterday's Enterprise. It's, uh, it's a classic. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, it seems like there's going to be uh, lots of stuff to catch up on now. I even feel like I even... I was trying to get through all these trailers and they did announce some some other stuff. They announced, like, who's going to direct some of these things. And I want to sort of dig into, like, who, who are these people? What else have they done? They've they announced some of the casting, like they announced who's going to be the star of some of these shows, like who's going to play Riri Williams and stuff like that. So now I want to like start digging into like who's this? What else have they done? How's this going to work? And that's how I'll spend my weekend. Mm-hmm. I'm just putting together some quizzy trivia questions for tomorrow's team lunch. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. you do trivia based on anything in particular or just random? Just anything. Got any trivia for me? Oh, I know. I'm who plays Linus myself. on Star Trek Discovery? <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. And the the winner of this prize is an iPhone. Yeah, who who's the C in MTJC? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Mark keeps saying we need to get a, somebody named C on, on a show cuz yeah, it was originally called A was it A J M something. I still think we should. I still think we should have named this podcast. Well, you guys started it. I just, I joined late, but uh, it should, still should be called more than just more than just Spock or more than just Trek or something. Just follow yeah. in the footsteps of great of greatness. Yeah, we'll just keep spinning yeah. them off. And now next up will be more than just Marvel. You know, more than just Marvel. More than just uh, Mandalorian. Yeah, we were joking a little bit about having an MTJC Plus where people can pay us fourteen ninety nine a month <laughs> for, for additional content. <laughs> be part of that yeah you don't, you don't have any trivia questions i just sent i've got four of them i need i've got a, a few here to put in literally Nothing. anything i mean i feel like you could say like how yeah. many how many doctors literally. have there been yeah again which like, people what might reasonably you dealing know. with how many doctor who's have there been yeah how many yeah but that's that's a uh, that's a tough question to answer because are we talking tv are we talking like everything there's been a few right do you want not just 13 uh, there's, not, there's not 14 doctors right that we that on the show and then there's the war doctor that's 15 you do like multiple choice or do they actually have to give you an answer multiple choice yeah well i mean you can do there's a different kind of questions but yeah you can i guess you can add different kind of i'm just doing i'm doing a multiple choice for tomorrow. yeah how many people yeah. walked on the moon how many human beings have walked on the moon 12 how many do you know i'm looking it up i just thought that was a good question okay. i don't have the slightest clue well then we're off yeah no it's so, so there's 12 11, of the 24 12, human beings who 14. have traveled to the earth from the earth to the moon have walked on its surface so far 12 of 20, 12 of 24 12. this is according to nasa okay that's a good one yeah mm-hmm. and, and kind of timely have given a, how many people have allegedly walked which, would you the like moon, to right? know their names it's neil armstrong buzz aldrin i can name oh, them go all. ahead <laughs> no it's okay neil armstrong buzz aldrin uh pete conrad alan bean alan shepherd edgar mitchell david scott james Irwin, john young charles duke gene cernan and harrison schmidt who was the last one to walk on the moon uh that's a good question let's see what it says there are only four surviving people who have ever walked on the moon mm-hmm. but who was the last one uh, apollo 16 thomas one. oh no this is uh hmm, who actually walked on the moon eh so there were 20 collins i think said. might be the last one no he never walked on the moon oh no he was on the crew you're right no he did walk on the moon what's the right answer he was on, oh that's orbited you're right 12 12 of 24 yeah uh surviving moonwalkers harrison schmidt apollo 17 it's like bonus question how many countries have walked on the moon <laughs> one <laughs> yeah <laughs> But did it you watch? Be did, you guys, did you guys watch the Chinese land their uh, lander on the moon the other day? Oh, did they? Do yeah. It? yeah, yeah. They there's a full video you could watch. Oh. Uh, them they basically like you know fly over and then they hover over and then they just settle down. It's pretty cool to watch. Mm-hmm. Did you guys yeah. <laughs> watch the uh, um, unfortunate landing of the uh, the, the rocket yeah. the other day? That happens, man. Uh, you know what? At least there was nobody on board. Yeah. Did they say why it? Why it um, no, I haven't seen failed? any follow up on that. Hmm. Apollo 17, final moon landing mission, remains the most recent time humans have traveled beyond low Earth orbit. Yeah, I, I, uh, I gave that funny bonus question because it's like, well, for the time being, it's only America, but China's getting there, and I yep. think India, India wants to get there as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think everybody's realizing that that's basically the the next great bastion for mining, right? Everybody wants to lay a claim to being able to go up there and start digging around and seeing what they can find. I mean, realistically, you can just bring back a bag full of dust and sell it for a fortune let alone the actual minerals and stuff that would be in there right right yeah they've n- haven't been to the moon in my lifetime or yours i may so they stopped before have 1981 the, have the leaves won the cup in your lifetime john what's that have the leaves won the cup in your lifetime no, john they have not no they have not <laughs> And, and not in your fandom That's either. Okay, the Kraken haven't won either, so you're. you're, you're All right, even. well, it's time to put some money down. How much? How much money goes down that the Kraken will win before the Leafs do? Oh, interesting. Ooh. Um, hey, look how fast the, the the Vegas Golden Knights were able to turn a, an expansion franchise into a cup contender. I don't think I'd bet against it. Yeah, that's the expansion teams. They they set them up for success in the modern era. Way uh, better I than mean, they did back in the day. Yeah, I mean, look at the the Seattle Sounders. Uh, your Seattle Sounders or my Seattle Sounders, at the very least are in the MLS Cup yet again mm-hmm. uh, after deciding to 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 spot two goals to Minnesota. I say, know, what a crazy comeback, eh? <laughs> that was, I had given up. I was like, man, I am so angry. What, what's going on now? And then they're like, wait, could be interesting. Wait, we're going into <laughs> overtime. Nope, no overtime here. Just 
<laughs> and just just finish it off. That yeah. was insane. Yeah, no, good for them. I mean, they are, you know, like them and the crew are sort of the class of MLS. They just seem to somehow always find a way to get there. TFC was good, consistent for a good four or five year stretch there, but we seem to be tailing off, unfortunately. And Vanny just quit. Our coach just quit too, which sucks. Who quit? Uh, Vanny, the coach of the Toronto FC football club. He just mm-hmm. uh, resigned after a disappointing season. Yeah, I mean, if it gives you any uh, weird hope, I'm not going to call it false hope because it's it's a very strange hope. So uh, every once in a while, my significant other says like, are they going to fire the coach? And the reason she says this is because the seemingly worst year for the Sounders was when they fired Siggy Schmidt when they were just doing awful and mm-hmm. hired or, or had uh, Brian Schmitzer uh, go in. And I was like, you know what? I will absolutely accept the idea of changing coaches mid-season every year if it means we win the cup every <laughs> I will live through the heart, uh, you know, the 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 heart attack sort of feeling mm-hmm. during the season. If it means that, like, at the end of it, you're gonna win. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so losing your coach is by no means a a uh, a bad thing because <laughs> maybe you might win the cup next year. Then. Yeah. Really. Yep. Oh, everybody can use a little hope. I personally, I'm a my my favorite sort of sport to watch nowadays has been basketball for the past number of years, uh, particularly because Toronto has been very competitive, but also just because the quality of the NBA. Has been very high and uh, can't. Sorry to rub that in, Seattle Seattle fan. Um, Oof, but, so uh, rough, man, for sure. But I can't wait till uh, basketball is only like a, two weeks away from starting up again, and uh, looking forward to seeing the seeing the hoops come back. That'll give me something to tide me over until the deluge of Disney Plus uh, shows starts coming through. And I won't stop in my advocacy for a Seattle Sonics return. I keep watching like a like a, a, a vulture. I'm like, who, who's <laughs> who's having issues? It, is is some old man die? Did, did somebody get divorced? <laughs> Is some uh, some city unwilling to provide a, a brand spanking new multi billion dollar stadium? <laughs> it's just waiting. Yeah, I, I really. I there's some markets too where I just I keep thinking over and over again, like how how is it Seattle doesn't have a team, but X city has a team? You know, Sacramento is the one that always jumps out to me. Like how how is there a team in Sacramento, California, but not one in Seattle? That just seems criminal. I mean, we 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 needed to institute like a socialism where I was like, all right, LA, you've got two teams. You don't really need more than the Lakers. Give us the Clippers. Yeah, I mean for sure. Like honestly, I I thought when uh, Balmer bought the team that that's where it was going, right? Like that seemed like the logical move. But now he's building them a stadium and he's committed to staying. And I don't understand. I don't. I don't get the rationale. Like it's a Lakers town. It's always going to be a Lakers town. There's nothing they can do that would make it not not a Lakers town. There isn't. It's not like Brooklyn and New York. Well, I still think everybody in New York is a hoops fan. Is still a Knicks fan. But I can see that there's enough of a population in Brooklyn that maybe you could make a dent. But in LA, you have no chance. You have no chance. And having LeBron come there and just win a title, like that just it just absolutely sealed that. Like there's nothing they could do to become, oh, this is a Clippers town. Like all people do is get Clipper season tickets so that they can see all the teams because they can't get Laker tickets. I, I don't get it. They've been talking for years that, you know, the, the greater Toronto area would be a perfect place to put another team or two in the NHL because oh, people would just, you know, they flood the stadiums and they'd sell all the tickets and people would buy jerseys. Like, hey, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a leaf town, right? I, I just don't know if you could do that. I, mean, I go up to Ottawa all the time for work. And Ottawa only got an NHL franchise back in the 1990s. They hadn't had a team since, the, I think, the 30s before that. And I go up there all the time. And you know who, who goes to those games? People, you know, who are Leafs fans who just like to see other NHL clubs, you know, like, and the, the most sought after tickets all season are when the Leafs come to town. And that's, you know, 300 kilometers away or whatever that is in miles. Yeah, there, there's something uh, definitely funny about that as a, as a long time suffering bad news bears seattle mariners fan <laughs> um i Our never have to wa- i never ever ever have to wonder are the yankees in town are the red sox <laughs> in town are the toronto blue jays or the chicago cubs in town because let me tell you those fans travel really well oh, yeah. and i think there are people who buy <laughs> season tickets just so they can resell them to those people for a premium price oh yeah. there an insane amount of blue jerseys uh when the the blue jays are in town yeah i've heard that uh the last few times in particular over the past few years when the Blue Jays started getting competitive again they said it was just they like the entire city of Vancouver the province of BC just basically just migrates down and watches the entire you know three or four games set yeah it's it's it's, it's pretty nutty yeah well yeah I, I I've always had a soft spot for the Mariners because they are the, the 
expansion cousins, right? They they came into the league uh, at the same time the Blue Jays did. And uh, I've always had this sort of affinity for that club as well. You know, and I, I love Ken Griffey Jr. is my favorite player of all time. Um, I just I just thought he had the most beautiful swing I've ever seen a baseball player take. And um, so I, I definitely was a sort of, you know, they were on my sort of tier of not local teams to cheer for. Uh, but man, you're right. Hard luck. Holy moly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a history of, of missed opportunities and failed things. Let's win 112 games and then flame out you know just oh awful yeah for me what would i rather have i see people complaining about the marlins i'm like look i know the ownership does weird things that actively tries not to win yeah and, and spends really weird but guess what they also do win yeah <laughs> they've won like twice yeah. in this whole time that the, that the mariners have like not so yeah. uh, I'll, I'll gladly take that over spending lots of bucks and <laughs> having nothing to show for it well and the devil rays too or the rays right like they're the same thing like that team has been just a catastrophe and yet they They've made the World Series like four times or five times in 20 years. Like, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that any day of the week. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. But hey, at least you got the Seahawks. Seahawks end up having to be the the, the good second choice for me, given that the, the the injury bug has just utterly decimated my yeah. Dallas Cowboys. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah I was going to ask they, if you were a, a Texas sports fan overall, just because you grew up in El Paso. Yeah. And in and, and NFL being my, my top choice for sports league, uh, the, the Cowboys are I'm a number one. And when you're on your second, third, fourth quarterback, because they've yeah. all been getting injured and yeah. your defense was terrible to begin with, and you're missing, like you've got people like, it's like, you know, Hey, let's just do uh whoever shows up to the bar. The 10th caller <laughs> gets to be the offensive lineman this week. Wasn't is... that what they did for the, the Broncos a couple weeks ago? They were basically like, we'll have a raffle and whoever wins gets to be our quarterback this week. It, it was pretty much that. Yeah. COVID has made things wild and crazy. Oh, so, yeah. Um, um, I am in many ways looking kind of forward to the, the NBA because they did the COVID thing right with the yeah. bubble and the tournament and everything. So, But then, uh, they're, then they're coming back and doing things the NFL way a little more now, right? They're going to travel. Now they're, they're supposed to cut down travel a little bit, but they're, they're going to travel again. And they're having things like they wouldn't let the Raptors have home games in Toronto this year. They're the Tampa Bay Raptors, right? That's... Yeah, that that whole thing and, and the Blue Jays. I'm a little unclear what's going to happen to them for. Oh, you MLB. mean the Buffalo Blue Jays, Jays? The, the Buffalo Bu- Buffalo Blue Jays? Yeah, the, 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 that's that's really odd to be like exiled from your own home country, which is very strange. Well, I mean. I got to be honest, I'm kind of glad. Like, we have enough problems. Like, this area is a real hot spot, and we're having a really tough time controlling the spread. The idea of bringing people in who are, you know, and again, it's not like they travel in small groups, too. An NFL team is a crazy amount of people traveling. But the next on that list is is the baseball teams, where they're traveling, like, 50 people around from place to place. That's dangerous, right? Like, that's just asking for trouble. Yeah. I'm just I'm thinking about, like, wait, so had things changed just a little bit, like, they got locked on the on the correct side of the border given where most of the league is um what would have happened if they'd been in canada when uh when things started getting locked down yeah, yeah. they may not have been allowed in uh which is weird well it's or funny, like one way talk- end of like you come in you ain't going home so yeah, just no, prepare true. to live in the u.s they were saying that um you know one of the issues that came up for the raptors that came out sort of after the season is one of the players for the team who was really good in the in winning the championship was mark gasol the center and his family was in Spain while he was in Florida playing inside the bubble recently for the for the NBA playoffs and Spain was also really very badly hit by the pandemic and he couldn't leave and they couldn't leave and he couldn't be with them and so he was really distracted and and struggling with real life while trying to you know play the sport that he was being paid to play and they said that you know that's one of the reasons why he kind of had a, a disappointing playoffs for the Raptors was that he just his head was not were on the game it was with his family which is what you'd expect but um you know those kind of things are going to be a challenge in sports you know like life is happening at pretty crazy paces around all these things that people are expecting you know oh we want the entertainment we want the sports we want these things these are still human beings with families and everything else right yeah yeah for sure But yeah, the NFL is a weird one. Like, I honestly, I cannot, I cannot even believe, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge NFL fan, um, uh, but the, I cannot believe that they've gotten through this far without adding a week or adding two weeks or just doing some things to mitigate it because some of the decisions they've made, like forcing Denver to play without a quarterback, forcing the the Ravens to play, it almost feels punitive. Like, it almost feels like they're like, well, should have been more careful. Get out of the fields. Like, it's like teaching kids 
needs a lesson or something. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see how the season continues to play out again. I wonder if we're going to get a, a Super Bowl or we're going to get a, a COVID Bowl in March. Yeah, I, I think if they don't start locking stuff down, at least for the playoffs, it is going to be a nightmare. Yeah. They're like, hey, uh, so like the starters can't play? It's like, what? <laughs> Yeah, starters can't play in the Super Bowl. Like we can't move the bowl. Like it just doesn't work. Well, one of the podcasts I listen to, they they talk about betting sometimes about sports. I listen to you know sports podcasts, and and they're saying like this is the craziest gambling year in in history because you know how how are you supposed to get any kind of understanding of what you're betting on when like teams are being ravaged by illnesses and and all these different things? Like it just nothing is what it seems, right? And there's no such thing as home field advantage. Again, Seattle used to be like the toughest place on the planet to play a football game because the Seahawks fans are insane but there are no fans so how do you bet on something if you lose that advantage yeah yeah or or non-home games like the San Francisco 49ers playing in Glendale Arizona exactly Santa right. Clara County has has locked down all sorts of activity yeah 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 and they they told them it was for a long stretch too right it was like you know two months or something right yeah it, it's something like that oh, yeah, crazy. Well, you all stay safe yeah don't don't play professional sports that's how you get the COVID so <laughs> unless you have a uh, unless you're a pitcher with the left hand then you're fine that's what that's where the real money is all right i'm gonna go i gotta go get some sleep theoretically yeah. work tomorrow yeah it's a thing yeah. all right all right talk to you next week guys bye